Okay, good morning. I'm so excited to see so many people here. I would say bright and early in the morning, but I'm a surgeon and, and seven is bright and early. So, <laughs> so but I know that it's, uh, it's a beautiful day and we have an amazing day uh, prepared for you. Uh, I'm David Brown. I'm the Associate Dean and Associate Vice President of Health Equity and Inclusion and Associate Professor of Pediatric Otolaryngology. And I wanted to welcome you to our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Gratitude Symposium. Uh, I'm pleased to guide you through today's uh, activities. Uh, today and every day, we appreciate the work that all of you do to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion at Michigan Medicine. While we gather twice a year, th th this time of the year is uh, uh, largely for you who are our diversity, equity, and inclusion leads and all the people who do the work here. Uh, it's really important that um, not only show appreciation for the amazing work that you do, but uh, we also like to have um, to have an amazing speaker who you'll hear a little bit more about later who can give us tools that we can use at Michigan Medicine. Today we will uh, also celebrate our latest rounds of diversity, equity, and inclusion mini grants. Um, these are innovative grants um, that you uh, can all apply for, no matter if you are a full professor or if you're a person working in the cafeteria, wherever you are, you can apply for one of these grants because we know that diversity, equity, and inclusion exists everywhere. And we're really uh, happy that uh, Dean Rungi has given us some resources to allow for learners, faculty, and staff to apply for these awards. Uh, and then we will, as I alluded to earlier, we'll have an, an inspiring presentation by our keynote speaker, Lenora Billings-Harris. So thank you for being here and participating in what promises to be an amazing and exciting day. And now I'd like to introduce our Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs, Dean of the Medical School and CEO of Michigan Medicine, Dr. Marshall Rungi. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, first, uh, thank all of you for the work that you've been doing. Uh, I, it's palpable the change that we're seeing. We're not where we want to be and aspire to be, but uh, you've had such positive impacts over the last several years uh, that it's really gratifying. As I take uh, opportunities to meet with and talk to different people throughout the medical school and the health system, uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Gratitude Symposium this morning. <clears throat> the themes of this symposium are, they revolve around respect, kindness, humanity, and accountability. And they mesh very well with a number of other uh, initiatives, including our wellness initiative that's being uh, headed by Carol Bradford and uh, Kirk Brower in the dean's office. Uh, they also mesh very well with uh, other initiatives, and I'll talk about the high reliability organization initiative and how I think that can be synergistic with what you all are doing. But most importantly, uh, I think that us as a community being mindful uh, and being appreciative of unique perspectives and talents that each of us bring to Michigan Medicine is incredibly important and it will create uh, the environment we all aspire to. I, many of you probably have gone through high, rel high reliability uh, training uh, with this, uh, this uh, group that we've contracted with called HPI. How many of you been, have been through your high reliability training? So qu quite a lot of you. Uh, the, as you know, uh, that initiative is focused really around patient safety as well as how do we achieve patient safety. But as you know from attending those sessions, achieving that relies on the same principles that you have brought to us and that we are working on, and that is communication, respect, accountability um, and bringing and, and reliability and doing the right thing every time and bringing those to patient care just as uh, equally important or perhaps more important doing uh, practicing those same practices with all of us and all of those who we work with. I think uh, several things that have uh, come to the forefront uh, recently uh, also cluster around the importance of leaders like yourself in getting out and rounding and having a chance to uh, really palpably understand what the culture is in the different areas in which you work. Uh, this is, uh, I'm kind of late to the game, but I uh, have started doing this uh, executive rounding this year. I have been to 
three different units here and we'll be going to many units during the course of the year. But it, it has been very eye-opening for me as I'm sure it will be for those of you who have not been doing this. And, and I think having you and our leaders uh, really understand the climate in their area uh, will help you bring back ideas. What, what do we need to do differently? Where are areas of concern that we didn't, uh, we didn't particularly appreciate the level of those concerns? I know that uh, during this day and before and after you work with each other on best practices, uh, I heartily endorse that as David, uh, Dr. Brown, Dean Brown uh, said, uh, I, I like to uh, think that this is, this is a core, I, I don't, don't just like to, this is a core value for us. Uh, this will be supported by the Michigan Medicine and by the Dean's office and, but support is the, the smallest part. The biggest part is all of you and what you are doing and what you will do. So I thank you for that. I thank you for your engagement of this, in this work. And uh, really, it's a pleasure to see all of you and to hear all of what you're doing. Uh, so uh, welcome and thanks again. Thank you, Dean Rungi. It's, uh, for the work that we do, it's, it's incredibly important to have the leadership not only endorse this but support this, and which I, I think we're all leaders. Maybe Dr. Rungi is the supreme leader of Michigan Medicine, <laughs> but we are all leaders, and so I am appreciative of all of you for supporting diversity and inclusion. As I've stated many times in the past, diversity and inclusion is not just my job or OHA's job, it's all of our jobs. We want this to be an amazing place that everyone wants to come, the place of choice to work, the place of choice to get care, where everyone feels valued and can thrive. So thank you. So to, the title of today's symposium uh, says it all. We are here to thank you and express, and express our tremendous gratitude for all you do every day to generate awareness of diversity, equity, and inclusion here at Michigan Medicine. I would like to share some highlights over the past year. There's numerous highlights, uh, so uh, I don't be offended if we don't mention you. I, we appreciate all of the amazing things that uh, you do, uh, but just to give um, people who may not be aware of some of the things that we're doing, uh, uh, I want to mention some. Uh, there have been many innovative ideas and commitments to continuous improvements that highlight the importance of diversity and inclusion that benefit our institution. And they're felt not just here at Michigan Medicine, but also at the University of Michigan. And uh, many of us share the work that we do nationally. So our office does, but I also know that many departments share their work in diversity and inclusion uh, at national meetings. We have 176 different leads, diverse and inclusion leads, that work on diverse and inclusion throughout Michigan Medicine. There are literally hundreds of different and exciting activities occurring. Um, for example, the MSA had a diversity week and that was uh, very well received. I heard amazing feedback from that. UMMG created a diverse and inclusion driver program and I, uh, done some of the walks that Dr. Rungi talked about, did some gimbal walks at a lot of our satellites, and uh, they're getting the message as well, thanks to Steve Vincent and other people, uh, to make sure that diversity and inclusion is not just on the main hill, but throughout Michigan Medicine. Uh, there have been onboarding programs and videos, and you actually see one of them um, from nursing today. Uh, and you're developing innovative and creative classes and programs to advance diverse and inclusion. When we go and talk to our colleagues around the country, uh, we realize that um, we are we're doing things that are far advanced than some other individuals. Here, we sometimes feel like we can do more, we can do more, and yes, everyone could do more, um, but I think we are doing more, so thank you. The Health Equity Index, this is uh, sponsored by the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, we had an opportunity to improve the work that we do uh, and with the help of Pedro from the office and our partnership with the Office for the Patient Experience, uh, we were able to get a higher score and this um, Health Equity Index looks at how we um, care for individuals uh, with LGBTQ plus um, and, and their identity. 
Um, we've made substantial progress uh, uh, over prior years. In fact, this year was the first time that we were the sponsor of Ann Arbor Pride. Uh, and we will continue to grow this because we know that this is important for the LGBTQ community. So we're happy to, uh, to sponsor um, activities and programs and education uh, for this community and other communities. This is just one example. There's a lot going on at Michigan uh, Medicine and the Research Conclusion, um, and it's sometimes exhausting when my, when I, my mind thinks of all the things, um, but it's really important that we keep this top of mind because this is how we create culture change at Michigan Me Medicine. Part of what we're doing today is also taking a breather uh, and acknowledging the work that we're doing instead of being on the, the treadmill of diverse second inclusion and, and doing uh, amazing work. Today we get to relax and reflect and also think about how we want to move forward. And it's, it's also important to realize where we are and where we need to go. One of the things I'm really excited about uh, is uh, an innovation that we've had in combination with human resources, uh, the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion, and, and IT and quality and safety, is to, uh, to figure out how do we evaluate the work that we do. Everyone, you know, all the finance people want to know what's the return on investment, and sometimes that's really hard to give a dollar number, but we've been very innovative by putting our collective inclusive minds together to develop the, the net promoter score. Uh, this will allow us to measure the culture here at Michigan Medicine, and many of you might have seen the question uh, that asks how confident are you that your work unit or department's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts are making a positive impact on culture in your work area or unit. This, these data from uh, the Net Promoter Score will allow us to track our progress and see where the areas that we're doing really well and understand why those areas are doing well and see areas that are not doing so well and figure out what do we need to do to help them along. Also allows us to track our overall system. So these data will be available to all of you uh, in the unit area as well as for all of Michigan Medicine. Um, another innovation that came out of uh, from Patty Andreski, uh, who helped out with the Net Promoter Score, is to recognize people and groups that um, have done well with the Net Promoter Score. So this year, for the first time, we have a new award. I'm excited to announce the Champions for Positive Culture at Michigan Medicine. And as we're doing diverse equity and inclusion, uh, one of the things that we really want to do is the impact uh, the culture of this institution. And it aligns with many of the things that Dr. Rungi talked about. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion should be a part of all of our priorities, and we want to measure that through measuring the culture. So with that in mind, I want to bring up uh, Patty Andreski and Phyllis Blackman to tell you a little bit more about the Net Promoter Score and the award. So. Thank you, David. So I'm so excited about this award because you know that everyone asks you all the time, what's the impact of the work that you're doing? And that's hard to measure, and we can and do use several measures, as you know, because a lot of you have been using the dashboard, and we have several different things going on there to help you gauge if you're making some impact in your areas. But another method that we've been promoting throughout Michigan Medicine is as David mentioned, the Net Promoter Score. And that is really simply to ask the people that you serve with, these are your colleagues, do you see a difference? Are we making a difference in the culture in our setting, in our unit, in our department? And the question was added to the Annual Employee Engagement Survey and the Faculty Satisfaction Survey, and will roll out in the Pulse Survey on Monday. So please make sure that people in your unit ask, take the survey and answer that question. It's very important. It really has sh been shown to be a tremendous indicator of employee engagement. So not only do we find out if you have m done some impact in your area, but are the people that you work with actually feeling engaged in the work? So it's very important. Please continue to encourage people in your units to participate in surveys. It really does give them a voice, and we really do listen to what people have to say. 
Now the DE&I net promoter score ranges from minus 100 to plus 100. So it's a huge range of available options for that score. And the champions for positive culture who are being honored today have been selected because the people that they work with said they are making a positive impact in culture in their areas. So they have a positive net promoter score and they also submitted a report to our office, which is very important because if you don't submit the reports, we don't have information to give other units to serve as best practices because we want to spread what's working out there, what is encouraging people, and what is increasing those net promoter scores. So we've also taken into account the size of the departments. So as you hear the awards, we'll have different sizes because we know it's sometimes a little easier when you have fewer people in your department to get more cooperation. So the larger size units have a little bit of a harder task. So we did take that into, into account. So I'm really excited and I think, is it David who's gonna announce our first set of winners? We're gonna do um, two of them at a time throughout the day. Thank you, Patty. And this is truly a, an innovation that um, we are doing here at Michigan. No one else is doing this particular question. And I know there's survey fatigue, but trust me, this only takes like a couple minutes to fill out. Uh, it's just a, a quick pulse survey. Um, and um, as Patty said, the scores range from a negative 100 to positive 100. And so the scores uh, are actually excellent. I remember there was a time when we first started, we were negative 60. And we were excited when we got to zero. And so, uh, because, you know, move from negative 60 to zero is humongous. So when I, um, when I uh, give you the scores for this, uh, realize that these are actually impressive and we still want to move forward. Uh, so uh, the first reward, and um, we have Patty Andreski and Phyllis Blackman to present them, and we'll have the, the individuals come up uh, to receive the award and take a photo with us. The first award goes to the Medical School Office uh, of Research, and the DI lead for this area is Sue Lowe, and their net promoter score was 18.2, which is excellent. So come on up. Is there anyone from the um, Medical School Office for Research that would want to come up and since you're part of that team? So if Sue's not here, okay, no worries. We'll move on to the next one. Um, so uh, this one is uh, off, uh, um, will be awarded to patient relations and clinical risk. And the diversity, equity, and inclusion lead is Carrie Schultz. And their net promoter score was 12.4. And again, this is excellent. So our Cindy Woods here. Come on. So uh, I thank you uh, um, for your excellent work and contributions, and hopefully this will motivate uh, others to do their net promoter score because there may be uh, a carrot on the other side, which is a really nice, uh, a, a nice thing to take back to your unit and celebrate how much you value diversity and how much you are making a difference uh, above and beyond. So now I'd like to reintroduce uh, Phyllis uh, Blackman, who is the uh, Managing Director of the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. You know, some people have a right-hand man. She's my right and left-hand woman. So <laughs> come on up, Phyllis. Good morning, everyone, and it is a pleasure to see so many of you here today. It is um, refreshing to see so much commitment to the diversity work that we are all doing at Michigan Medicine. So, as, as David said, I'm Phyllis Blackman. I'm the Director in the Office for Health, Equity, and Inclusion. And I am joined today with Clarissa Love, our DEI consultant, 
as well as Steve Vincent, who is the specialist in ambulatory care, a finance specialist in ambulatory care, and Wayne Millette, who is the director in the office, excuse me, faculty life, faculty and resident life in the Department of Surgery. So today, we're going to talk to you about um, the title of our presentation is Building Bridges Across Difference for Sustainable Change. So there are two words that are key here, bridges and sustainable. We've been on a journey for three years, going into our fourth year, but we have now built bridges to be able to engage each and every one of you in the work that we are doing. Excuse me. So our vision in OHE is to ensure that Michigan medicine is a place where everyone feels valued and can thrive. So that's everyone. That's our faculty, our staff, our learners, our, our visitors, our patients. We want to make sure that everyone feels welcome to Michigan medicine. As I said, that we have been building the, on our vision for four years. We're in year four of our plan now, and it is moving very, very well. And as you can see, as David stated earlier, that we want to measure everything that we do. We want to make sure that it is of value, and we make sure that if there are changes, we're able to make those changes. And listen to the voices that uh, we hear across Michigan Medicine of things that need to be done. So we're asking all corners of Michigan Medicine to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion and bring it to their workplace and make it part of their culture. It is through collaborative efforts that we help advance diversity, equity, and inclusion at Michigan Medicine. It is through intentional partnerships and synergies that we've helped to move the needle in our efforts. It is not the efforts of one unit, but partnerships in our business units, our finance units, because we want to make sure that we can show the return on our investment here, and to engage our existing relationships and resources that keeps us moving forward. So when we think about our partnerships, look at all of you. You are all our partners. It's not just our office. It's all of you that help us keep moving forward. So like many universities, Michigan Medicine is decentralized in nature. This is perhaps our greatest challenge, but yet it, we forego with 200 plus engagement activities. So we, what we've done is to engage all of you. We want to hear the voices of the people to help us build our reports. And so we started out in 2015. This was a 12 month planning process and we are engaged with the, the direction from President Schlissel and the uh, diversity office on Central Campus that helps us to pull all of this together. We started out with 49 plans and then we moved to 51 plans and one unit has come offline so we're now at 50 plans for the University of Michigan. The plans la launched in October 2016 and we as I said we are in year four of our plan. So if we we look around and say how do we move this forward? The way that we move it forward is the buy-in from our leadership. If we have leadership buy-in, that is key. And we have many leaders in this room that have helped us to move diversity, equity, and inclusion forward. So our president has embraced and he has stated that in his first five years that diversity, equity, and inclusion was a priority. He is here for five more years and that continues to be his motto. He will continue with the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, work that we're doing. And it's not the end. After five years, it doesn't end. Our goal is to change the culture of Michigan medicine. And it's to change the culture of the University of Michigan at large. Our Dr. Marshall Runge, as you can see, he's here. He believes in the work that we, we're doing. He supports the work that we are doing. And he looks to us to help to guide him and to guide each and every one of us in the work that we're doing. So one thing that we've done, um, I've helped, I've started a, uh, designed a strategic, um, uh, a steering committee. 
And this steering committee will help to guide us, provide resources for us, and to hear the voices of those that are at Michigan Medicine. So our, this, this executive, um, this DEI operational, um, this is our structure. And so we have an executive sponsors, Drs. Brungi and Bradford and Tony Denton are our executive sponsors. And they will help to set the vision and the overall strategy and direction that we are going for Michigan Medicine. They will build our institutional support and to lead our operations through um, implementation and to assist us with the resources and removing the barriers that we often face. We also have our leadership sponsors, which is Dr. David Brown, uh, Dolores Hunt, or D. Hunt, who is our Chief Human Resource Officer, and Sonia Jacobs, who is our Chief Organizational Learning Officer. These are our key partners. If you think about it, that our um, our human resources a key partner for us because they have access to many, many of the staff members that are here. So it is important to make sure that HR is engaged. Sonia Jacobs is our Chief Organizational Learning Officer and she helps to provide us direction for us as we begin to build programs and educational opportunities for faculty and staff and our learners. And so they are, um, they are the oversight for our strategy, they approve the decisions that we uh, make and make sure that we're on the right track with things. And what is key here is our steering committee members. And that's many of you in the room here. And this is a very diverse group of representation across Michigan Medicine. And even though you may not see your unit or particular unit, this is a group that will convene twice a year. They will help to advise us and give us direction or even to let us know some of the things that may be happening in their area. So as you can see, we are anywhere from the patient care through the, through the student environment, from quality, our patient experience, so there, are, there is a diverse group of people that come together twice a year to talk about the efforts that we have. So our working group, our diversity working group um, is key also. We have our metrics and measurements, we have our education and training, communications, as well as our implementation group. These are the people that, will, that are actually doing the work. They are me making sure that we have our net promoter scores. We make sure that we are sending out the surveys. And even though there may be survey fatigue, we need to continue to measure the work that we are doing. And then we have our advisory support groups. These are our resource groups. And we have a variety of opportunities for people to come together with conversation and to let us know what what are we hearing here what what are the staff members feeling what are some of the other units feeling and this can be communicated up so we have communication from the top and from the staff level from the resource groups and together we can come up with a plan because there are things that the staff members may share and the leaders may not know anything about us. So we want to make sure that we have opportunity to hear the voices of Michigan Medicine. So who does our plan support? It supports everyone. It supports all of you. It supports all of the units, our faculty, staff, our house officers, our college students, our patients. And we have a structure that is in place here that supports everything that we do. So many of you have already seen the, the wheel here that describes our strategic plan, but we already have the infrastructure and the foundational support in place to support the new things that come on board. So again, we have 50 unit plans that rose up into one strategic uh, University of Michigan strategic plan. And you will be able to hear more about the plan for year four on October 14th, I believe it is, October 16th, when uh, Rob Sellers will talk to us about the report and the things that are that have come out of that. It is some amazing, there are some amazing things that are happening uh, across the campus that we are all invited to attend. So who do we engage? Look at the room. We engage you. We engage everyone. We need to hear your voices. We need to hear your concerns. We need to hear your opinions. We want to hear everything. We can't make a decisions and change culture in a bubble. So it's important that we hear from each and every one of you from your units. Engage in conversation.
It's important to have conversation because so much comes out of that. So this was a very good uh, activity and we, can, we will continue to have these types of settings to engage people in community conversations. And here we are, our first Friday is a opportunity for each and every one of you to join us here on the Hill or wherever here on the University of Michigan main campus for conversations. Sometimes it can be specific topical um, uh, conversations or it can be conversations, um, that things that just may come up whenever um, people just have something that they want to discuss. Third Thursdays, we cannot forget about our offsite practices. Michigan medicine is in a lot of different places. And we want to make sure that everyone is included and feels valued. And again, our community conversations, it is important that we continue to communicate with each other. And as you hear me say, it is important. I will continue to say over and over again that we need to hear your voices. If there is no conversation, we won't know how to move next. Another opportunity are our resource groups. We are creating and establishing resource groups. They are up and functioning. And these resource groups are open to anyone who wants to participate. Our faculty, our staff, our learners, and we encourage you all to get involved. These resource groups are, we are just recently started our veterans group and our working families group. These are important to people. This is what we've heard through our conversations. How do we establish our, our, our resource group? So some of the groups are established. Uh, we start them in OHE, but OHE does not have to be the one to continue with the groups. There are so many competent and capable people to to keep these resource groups going. So we encourage you to get involved. So again, our vision in OHE is to ensure that Michigan medicine is a place where every person feels valued and can thrive. And that again means you. I will always include everyone because we want to be inclusive of the work that we do. Relationships. There, is, there are so many resources here at Michigan Medicine. <clears throat> Excuse me, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. There is no need to start something new because it exists. And you will find in your communications that people are here, they are, they are willing to help. All we have to do is open our mouths and ask. And you will be surprised at how many people will say, I want to be involved. Thank you for asking me, what else can I do? And this is how we show that we are the leaders and the best, that we are an inclusive environment and we have so much to offer to our public, to our patients, to our, our families, to each and every one of you to make sure that you are successful in your day-to-day -day work. And I thank you so much for the work that you're doing for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if there's anything that I or my office can help you with, or if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. So now I will turn this over to Clarissa and she will tell you a little bit more about what we do to engage our lead. So thank you. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Um, as you can see, there's a lot happening in our organization, but we decided it would be a nice time to pause because we this is a time where we recognize our leads to tell a little bit about how we engage them um, and so that everybody hears the same message and then uh, this will be a lot, you know, allow you to think about how to utilize your leads better in your departments. So our leads uh, have quarterly lead meetings. Uh, which and during those lead meetings we bring sometimes we bring in guest speakers sometimes leads present um, but we try to bring forward best practices of things that are happening across Michigan medicine and sometimes it's not just at Michigan medicine sometimes it's something happening in the university or the larger DEI world um, and those meetings happen uh, for us to serve as a community and really to learn from each other and sometimes they have really fabulous ideas um, and out of those meetings we generate and are able to act on them the leads have three primary responsibilities. They are to communicate, collaborate, and to champion diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, as a part of those, I want to explain them just a little bit. So in terms of communication, it is 
impossible and we have heard consistently that you don't hear the messages from us unless it comes from the most proximal leader to you. And so we rely heavily on our DEI leads to get uh, key messaging out to your local unit and department. Um, the next piece is collaborate. One of the things that we've learned from doing this work is it works best when there are centralized DEI committees based in the local department that are able to identify actionable items uh, that really apply to that local unit. And so we ask them to collaborate and not come up with those action items alone, but to pull in others from the department, even if it's just for a focus group, but really to have some sustainable conversation around it. And the last piece we ask them is to model this work, right? So the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, is really tough because it requires that we all walk the talk um, and we can't just show up. We have to walk and show it every single day. Uh, and so as a part of Champion, we really encourage them to model it. Um, we ask them to take on educational offerings so that they can build their skill set. Um, and we are so excited to see all the work that they are doing and really championing the work. We also provide a, a new thing that we've introduced over the last year as we have a DEI lead charter. This document serves as a commitment agreement between our office, the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion, the local department, and the DEI lead to set clear expectations of what should happen in the coming year. We also provide, uh, this is just a sample, but we also provide DEI lead onboarding every month uh, where we welcome new leads to our community. Um, sometimes for a variety of reasons, leads might cycle off or have new opportunities. And so we try to onboard them. This is really a amazing opportunity because it allows for us to have just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. We go over the charter and documents and we're able to do question and answers um, in more detail as well. And the other thing that we do is we provide uh, the leads, DE&I leads, a set of resources. They have a playbook that we use that we give them that really covers um, the University of Michigan's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion definitions. Um, as you may come to know or see, there's different interpretations of what people say when they mean DE&I, and so this helps to level set. It talks about how we capture data, how we track and um, ask them to do reporting, and so that all happens in their playbook. And we actually have recently introduced a new DEI lead portal um, where the leads are able to go and access all of their documents in real time, and it has, it's like a warehouse of all so sorts of amazing content. Um, it has all of the educational content. It also houses different policy initiatives, things around hiring and selection. Uh, but the portal is a really fabulous place and a tool for our leads to move forward. So, you know, one of the last pieces that we uh, do in our lead meetings is we always try to inspire each other. And we have the leads come forward. And this past year, um, I'm going to pick out one lead. She's going to be embarrassed that I'm going to say something about her. Um, but, you know, DEI, and I, we've had to learn through trial and error some things we have to adjust and we have to change. And Kate Verbal, who is one of our DEI leads, um, she really worked hard this past year and rebranded all of her DEI messaging and she shared it collectively with our DEI lead community and that really woke us up and they talked about how they really have infused gratitude and in journaling into their DEI work. Um, and those are just some of the examples of how we learn from each other uh, and think about what does it mean? It does diversity, equity, and inclusion sometimes turn people off from the conversation? How do we broaden and enrich um, our conversation? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because you, get to, you will get to see later on this afternoon all the innovative things that happen as a part of our community when we present our DE&I mini grants. Um, but I, what I will tell you is that the leads are always looking for new ways in which to seek out opportunities to work together uh, and to work individually, um, to come up with solutions to things that they're seeing happening within their unit, but not only just in their unit. I really see them thinking about the collective of Michigan Medicine and how we can really push our organization culture forward. Without further ado, I'm going to invite Steve Vincent up. He's going to, um, and after Steve is going to be Wayne Millette, and they're both two of our DEI leads. Uh, Steve is our DEI lead for U University of Michigan Medical Group, uh, and Wayne is for um, Department of Surgery, and they're both going to share insights about how, what they have done in their local environments.
Thank you, Clarissa. I love coming in this room. The uh, creative football shape at the uh, edge of the, the building I think is pretty cool. Uh, an innovative football reaching the end of the landscape is a rarity in Ann Arbor these days. <laughs> Shh. Um, I just wanted to share real quick um, the scope of ambulatory care, which is the, uh, the service that our committee represents. So we have over 50 locations, uh, I'm sorry, 50 locations, 165 units, um, 2.5 million outpatient uh, visits, uh, procedures, uh, over 18,000 ambulatory care or OR cases, um, about 300,000 ambulatory care radiology exams, uh, over $2 billion in, in uh, operating revenue, and 6,000 staff members, uh, about half a, a billion dollars in employee staff uh, benefits and salaries. So we have a, a large group, and this does not include faculty. Uh, a large group representing a, a, a diverse population of individuals. Our committee uh, is pretty diverse. It doesn't look that diverse, but it is, trust me. Um, we, we have 14 members, volunteers, who really represent uh, a different range of perspectives. We have frontline staff, we have managers, we have administrators, uh, we have our HR uh, business uh, partner, and uh, administrative uh, administrators on that committee as well. In addition to our committee, we have partner committees um, uh, into departments. Uh, Odo, Dr. Prince is here, is a, a committee that we work with as well, psychiatry, social work, uh, and cancer center. So we work with a lot of different groups throughout um, uh, Michigan medicine. Um, our, our committee, a couple of things that we focus on uh, when we have our monthly meetings, We've, I think we've had about 36 straight meetings. We, we never cancel. We, we try to make sure we have that face-to-face -face time because that's important, uh, even though we're, we're spread out. Uh, we have different subcommittees. Um, one of them is communication. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter that we send out, uh, and that's kind of our major communicative um, strategy there. We have our DEI, DEI driver program that, that Dr. Brown mentioned, and we'll get into that a little bit later, which are local level champions that are focused on our DEI initiatives. Uh, we have our learning committee that focuses on um, some of our training in terms of bystander intervention, unconscious bias, uh, our metrics subcommittee uh, that works, on, works with the DI dashboard that Patty and others in HR have helped to push out to us. And we also have a community kind of engagement committee that we're just, subcommittee that we're starting that's going to look at health disparities and leveraging our PFAC uh, feedback that we're getting as well. Uh, and then we really try to make sure that everybody is, our, all ver voices are heard, uh, and at least um, our, all of our members have to serve on at least one subcommittee. So making sure everybody's engaged um, with respect to that. We don't have time to get into our website today. But typically in the presentation, I would open it up and kind of walk you through it. But um, ha more than happy to share that information with you um, if you guys are interested. Steve Vinson. Um, in terms of training, um, unconscious bias. We had a blitz that we did um, in terms of pushing out the unconscious bias training. So what we did is we created five different hubs throughout southeastern Michigan. Uh, we kind of call them our anchor sites. Um, West Ann Arbor, we have one. I-275 corridor, we have Northville. Northville 2 is coming soon. In the Livingston area, we have our Brighton Specialty Clinic. Um, and then in East Ann Arbor, Domino's Farms. And so with these anchor sites, facilities that can accommodate large groups, we set up training along with OHE uh, and some of the trainers that are in this room, actually Latanya, Beth, um, and helped us uh, push out unconscious bias training to our, to our group. So we, we did, and in four months, 17 sessions, trained about 500 staff. So that was one of uh, the training initiatives that we worked on. Uh, with respect to UMMG, and that, that really helped with in terms of efficiency and providing training to all of our kind of spread out um, groups. With respect to the driver program, it's a volunteer program. Uh, again, it's very similar to the M Healthy Champions uh, that you, you know, you hear about that we have here. Uh, and these volunteers, we, ha we started the pilot program uh, in 2018. We had seven clinics and 10 drivers. Uh, we increased that to 20 clinics and 30 drivers. Uh, this year, uh, that starts out with a climate survey, very similar to the Pulse survey that we're doing next, uh, starting next week, uh, to kind of gauge where we're at and identify gaps. And we move into forming action plans, uh, which are uh, staged and making sure we keep track of that over time. 
We have learning webinars because we are so spread out and making sure we're focused on desk desktop education. We move to quarterly luncheons, again, face-to-face -face time uh, and sharing best practices and networking with our drivers. And then we move on to our yearly retreat. So we're having our first one in a couple weeks. Uh, and that's really where we recognize and, and provide exposure to our drivers. We have leaders coming to that. We have a very accomplished panel. Uh, and, and our OHE partners are really helping us out with respect to that, that driver retreat. So we're looking forward to that in a couple weeks. And that, that has helped um, with uh, a mini grant fund as well. So thank you guys, OHE. Um, and then lastly, some of our keys to success, again, leadership support, the same message that we've kind of heard before. Uh, we have many of our leaders are modeling um, what we're, you know, our values and initiatives uh, with respect to that. We have connected communication between our committee, our drivers, our clinics, uh, again, using our newsletter. Um, we're not just checking boxes. This is a lifelong learning opportunity and uh, making sure that these skills are developed over time. Uh, we strengthen numbers. We started out with a committee of four, same gender, same race. Now we have 14 uh, with a lot more diverse perspectives. Uh, and then, again, valuing multiple perspe perspectives. Dr. Rungi mentioned it before. Uh, I think there's a synergy between high reliability and DEI and making sure we're leveraging that as well. So uh, that's kind of the, some of the things that we're doing within uh, ambulatory care. And I'm going to pass it on to Wayne for the Michigan Promise. Thank you so much, Steve. It, you know, I'm somewhat um, – does this work? Yeah. Okay. For those of you who don't know me, um, again, my name is Wayne Millett, Department of Surgery. Um, before now, I was a uh, elementary school principal, and as such, I always come forth with a problem for you to solve. So you do need to uh, a, just to pull a pen out and a, just a piece of paper to write on. I am going to talk about what we're doing in surgery. But first, I'm telling you a story. And I know it, that we, I'm, OK. So, so, so the first thing I want you to do is to choose a number between 1 and 10. You really don't need a piece of paper to do this, but you, I want you to write this down as well. I want you to multiply that number by two. I want you to add 24 to that number. <laughs> number between one and 10, you're gonna multiply it by two. You're gonna add 24. Then you're gonna subtract the original number. Okay? I want you to raise your hand if you did not get the answer 12. Did not get the answer. So everyone, you chose a number between 1 and 10. You multiply that number by 2. You add a 24. And then you subtract the original number that you chose. And the answer should be 12. OK. I didn't write my instruction down properly. <laughs> All right. We'll have, to, we'll have to solve that problem a little bit later. But if, if <laughs> All right, my time is limited. The, the point here is, the point here is if I gave you all of the instructions and I didn't quite write them down, all, all of you should have gotten the answer 12. And the, the point of this problem is that no matter where you are in this, this, this DEI continuum, we're all starting from different places. But the idea is for us to end up along this continuum to be improving from year to year. That's really the point of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to zip through this. Um, and and the, the, the point that I wanted to make about that exercise is that what we're doing in surgery doesn't mean that these are things that any other department should be doing or, or, or need to do. But figure out where you are and what it is that you're wanting to do and create a, 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 a strategy to get there. So in surgery, we started off. Um, um, a, a few years ago, three years ago, at, at a faculty retreat, and the department chair asked the question, what is, it, what is it that we're doing that we need to keep, what is it that we're doing well that we need to keep doing? What is it that we're not doing that we need to start doing? And what is it that we're doing that we, that we need to drop because it's not effective? 
by all measures, by most measures, the Department of Surgery is one of the top departments of surgery in the country. If you look at NIH funding, we're certainly ranked at one of the top in the country. I'm going to go fast. If you look at our residency program, again, it's ranked one of the top in the country. But we have a problem. We recognize we had a problem. This is our uh, racial composition demographic of our, our for, from 2005 to 2015 in our department. Um, there's a problem there, right? Most of our faculty are white males. If you take a look at gender, over the, over the 10 year period of this graph, the lines really don't change. It continues to be the same. So we wanted to put some structures in place to address this problem. So if I was to show you a graph over the next, if I, if I showed you a graph from 2016 when we started this to 2026, our goal is for both of these things to look very different. And so some of you have heard of Scott Page. He talks about you know, the diversity bonus. And if, in fact, you want to change behavior, if you want, <clears throat> in terms of introducing diversity and, and having your organization be diverse, you really have to begin to look at the structures that your, your department the real structures within your department. And I'm going to uh, go through uh, these slides pretty quickly because my time is going to... Okay. Um, I've been given some more time. What I will tell you is that good intentions are often not good enough when we're talking about doing this kind of work. Um, the Department of Surgery set out to do something, and the word that's been pretty constant through most of the previous kind of, uh, presentation has been this notion of sustainability. And as we set out to create our program, we really wanted something that was going to be lasting over some long period of time. So we talked about a phase implementation. And we're talking about primarily faculty here. And if for faculty in the room, you know, it's a group of folk that don't change very well. Like if you give faculty a form to fill out, you know, like if you give the entire university, HR is really familiar with this. If you give, give everybody on staff at the university a form just to fill out, to check and send it back. The last group of folk that will send it back are often the faculty, right? And so it's a group that, that uh, so we talked about, we have to do consciousness, conscious, consciousness raising, we have to go through education, we have to do empowerment and, and, and governance, and we, again, had to put some things in place um, to really educate our faculty as to why this is really important. So the kinds of things that we have done, again, practical things, but structural things. Our DNC used to be the, the moderators of our DNC for the last five years were mostly males. And so what did we do? At the time, Dr. Mulholland, who was our chair, said he's just going to rant. Like, he was the moderator, so he gave up all of his slots, and these are the folks that he chose to be moderators a couple of years ago. Right? In terms of education, we set out to, we have a program called the LDP, where we spend three, four times a year where we bring in folks from around the campus to really educate our faculty who have an interest in being leaders in the field of surgery. Um, in terms of, we have, a, we have a, a, a series, we have grand rounds, two, three times a month. So we took a, couple, a few of those, four of those per year, and we so said we're going to introduce, we're going to invite some folks to come talk to us about things that we often don't talk about in our grand rounds. So we invited Scott Page to come and talk about the diversity bonus. We invited Caprice Greenberg, who's a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin. What her title was, interestingly, was Stop Fixing Women, was her title. We don't talk about that in, in a grand round in surgery. We most recently had Henri Ford, who is, the, who is one of two African-American deans of medical school in the country. He recently came and talked to us. And so again, when you talk about, that's nothing new, but we are, we're being intentional. The structure isn't, we didn't change the structure of Grand Rounds, but we're being very intentional about the kind of folks that we want to have our faculty engaged with. Um, we have a women in surgery program that started a few years ago. Now, not only is it a local program, but we have people coming from all over the, for the world, quite frankly, to our women in surgery program. In terms of, we looked around in our 
the, 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 the executive committee of, our, of the department was, again, primarily senior faculty, white males. We said, we want some new faces. And so there was nothing in our bylaws that said we couldn't expand what our executive committee, the numbers in our, our executive committee. So we invited some new folks to be part of our executive committee. And this is what they look like. A lot of these folks are junior faculty, by the way. On the executive team, this is the team that really makes the big decisions in the department. We added those folks a couple of, a couple of years ago to be part of that executive team. And again, primarily junior faculty. Um, this word is, is, has permeated. We recognize that what we do in the Department of Surgery at Michigan really affects surgery around the country. These are all faculty who have left the university in the last few years to become chair of departments of surgeries across the country. So if we are training future leaders to go out and, and make change, we strongly believe that we're setting, and I think Dr. Brown mentioned earlier, you know, there, there are institutions around the country that are looking to us for leadership. And this is a good example of it. So these folks are out doing some of the things that they learned about uh, at the university. And so this is why we came up with the, and I'm gonna go through, I think I got about three more minutes or so. I'm gonna wrap up to talk about one program in particular. So we came up with this thing called the Michigan Promise. And you can see it's a host of eclectic kinds of programs. But we feel like we wanted to create programs that will meet our faculty where they are. We wanted to engage them. And when we talk about diversity or DEI, it's a very broad, holistic approach. The one program I want to get to is um, we have a, you know, the Michigan Promise. We have our, 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 our um, a mission. Um, but I want to get to one program. This is our early development program where we send um, each faculty that we hire, we have a launch team for them, a three-year launch team that we commit. And um, that's one of the best programs according to some of the early surveys that we have done from the young faculty. So we, we, we basically, because young faculty come and tell us that they are interested in lots and lots of things. But then we put a promotional packet on the left-hand side and say, how does that impact? What, what does that fit into what it is that you're going to need to do in terms of getting promoted? Um, but the real program I want to get to is our recruitment. Um, I'm going to go back here. I don't know how to go back. There we go. Um, the recruitment, and that's how I'm going to end my, my talk with you this morning. We have seven divisions within the Department of Surgery. All seven divisions used to conduct their own recruitment process in the past. Mostly what happened, people replicated themselves. Those first few graphs that I showed you, that's how we ended up there. When people, you simply, you know, the friends you went with and the buddies that you went with in residency, those are the folks that you call on when it's time to hire a new faculty. So what we did was we gotten rid of all of the division level recruitment committee and we created one departmental-wide recruitment committee, making sure that all seven divisions were represented. We then set out to train all of the members of the committee in unconscious bias, in, in all of those things that we think we deem is important. And so every faculty that comes and get hired at the University of Michigan comes through on their first visit, come through the recruitment committee because if we're sitting at a departmental level and we want to change what those graphs in the beginning look like, it's really hard to do that from a section level. You can do that from a, from a, from a departmental level. So I, I'm going to end, and I think that's when we talk about, as Scott Page talked about, when you talk about creating change, you have to at some point create and change the structure in order to get you to that change. Now, I also have to tell you that wasn't always we rank the candidates when they come. So if you have three or you have four, we also tell the committee that you need to bring on campus an underrepresented minority or a woman candidate when you come on campus. Our number one candidate for a particular search hasn't always been the number one candidate of the division chief. 
And so there's some rubber hitting the road there. The department chair has said he believes in the wisdom of 20 versus the wisdom of one. So we have one out. And I wanted to show you the last graph in terms of our, over the last three years, this is what our graph now over the last three years looks like in terms of the amount of faculty that we have hired. So in 10 years, imagine what that was going to look like. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to uh, all our, our speakers. What I'd like to do now um, is to open up the floor to see if you guys have any questions or comments. Um, the Department of Surgery is a large department um, and um, maybe differently resourced than other departments as well and have the ability to do this, but you may have some questions and ideas of how uh, all these groups got started with their work or you may have some comments of things that you've done in your area. So uh, if someone has a question or a comment, uh, I'd open up the floor for that and we can um, have this mic go to that area. So anyone have a question for the last three? Way in the back, Laura Denton. Um, no, let's use this. Yeah, let's use that. Um, good morning. My question is for Wayne. I'm curious about um, your recruitment of faculty. Do you also interview internal um, candidates like trainees? when you um, when you're looking to hire yes, yes. Um, and, and we're very careful because the, the the problem that we often not problem the challenge that we often find with internal candidates is that we have that so what I call self creep in that we judge faculty based on their experience that that that's in their CV but often we find that when we interview internal candidates, we know more than what's on the CV. And people like, people dislike. And so we're really careful about what it is and how it is that we allow some of that creep to come in because res we do have a couple of residents on the search committee and we're really careful about not having internal knowledge of those candidates impact their candidacy. And one of the great best practices uh, for recruiting for diversity is to make sure that you set the standards of what you want and, uh, and for, for the position and stick to that and, um, and then select your candidates and don't veer from that instead of making your criteria around a particular individual. You know? And so we often are biased toward people that we know, but there's a lot of great talent out there. Are there any other questions or comments from the audience? In the way back there, Dr. Joe, I better know everyone's name from now on or else I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> Has there been any progress in hiring African-American surgeons? Um, I'm going to be careful how I answer this question. One of the slides that I did not show is we're very serious about creating partnership with underrepresented organizations that, that, are, um, that, rep that, that are underrepresented. So LM LMSA, we go to Society of Black Academic Surgeon. Every year we go to those conferences and we try to make some partnership or create partnership among them. And so one of the, to answer the question, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of dance around the question really. Um, and answer it in, 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 a, in a way that um, doesn't give you a very narrow answer. You know, we're interested in hiring the very best faculty, bar none. What we have done in the past is that we recruited our window of places that we place ads and recruited faculty was very limited, right? So if you think about a pie, we didn't advertise for the whole pie. What we're doing now is saying we want to broaden the scope and the areas of, and places that we recruited. And so have we recruited more faculty of color? Um, the numbers are trending upwards. I think it's too few yet to really say. But, you know, for lots of, and I don't want to sort of take the space here, but, you know, we hired Gifty Kwachi. 
um, has had the very best. She's a woman from Ghana, um, went to the best schools in the country, went to the best, one of the best residency for her area in the country. And she was headed to, she came from the East Coast. If she didn't get a job on the East Coast, she was very much headed to the West Coast, right? When, we, when she came here and she saw the Michigan Promise and the things that we said that we were going to, to do and, and have started doing, her mind was changed and she accepted a position at Michigan. And so it's, it's beyond what you say. It's, recruiting is one thing. Retention is a whole other piece. And so I think, you know, rather than the question is about what, you know, like how many Latinos were re recruited, how many Asians were recruited, how many African Americans were recruited. We want to recruit the very best, but we want to open up the avenue where we, 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 we initially uh, place our ads and, and try to reach folks. There's a question over here. And then one in the back, so we have time for two more questions in the back and then the front first, in the back first. It's on. Okay, um, and I work in Michigan Medicine Development, and so my area is a little bit different, but my question is to um, either, um, and that is, has, has there been a noticeable difference already, or what is the difference you anticipate in the experience of trainees and junior faculty? Because I think one of the challenges that we have is creating a case for how hiring diverse leadership and um, makes a difference in um, retention and, and in, in including uh, junior staff. Does that make sense? Yes, and is that directed to Wayne? It's directed to either. Where is Wayne? Because we're not a, a medical unit, so. Yeah, so I, uh, Wayne, do you wanna start? So, you know, uh, for our faculty uh, ranks, 70% of our faculty actually come from our training programs. And so it, it is really important that we increase the pipeline in our residency in our medical school. We have actually more than doubled our underrepresented uh, residents in the past three years. Uh, and we do need to be intentional in how we mentor and prepare them for uh, careers in academic medicine if we want them to do that. What we found, what I found when I uh, first had, uh, started this job and met with a lot of the residents is that not all of them were being mentored uh, for a career in academics. Uh, and so it was, it was variable by department as far as um, uh, the preparation, as far as doing research, as far as having a, an ideal mentor. And so those are areas that we're trying to strengthen. And so um, in, in our office, we have an individual who works every area of the pipeline. So we have Alex Blackwood, who is pre-med from junior high school on up to uh, college. Uh, we have Fermi Okalami, who you'll see soon, who helps us out with our medical students, Marcia Perry with our house officers, and Gary Freed with our, um, with our faculty. And with each of those area, or with each of those parts of the pipeline, we're very intentional in uh, five areas that um, we want to focus to promote diverse equity and inclusion. And again, we think of diverse equity inclusion very broadly, but it is um, recruitment and retention, uh, professional development and leadership, coaching, uh, mentorship and sponsorship, um, community building and networking because it's important to feel that you belong here and to figure out who your networks are and the community is to support you. And we also feel that wellness is important because that's uh, wellness is an issue in medicine in general. And if you are part of a, a underrepresented identity, I think that compounds uh, wellness and compounds burnout. So we're very intentional in all of those. So it's a process. We are making some strides. We have some increased numbers, but uh, it takes it does take some time. So thank you for your question. We have time for one more question over here, and then we'll move on to our panel. Um, mine is more of a statement. Um, and it kind of segues into what you just said. Mm -hmm. in, I'm in radiation oncology, and what I find on resident interview day is I don't see um, that diversity um, coming through in those um, med students coming through on resident mm -hmm. day. So one of the faculty and I, I said, how do we find the med students and talk to them in their first year and talk to them about radiation oncology? Yes. And we held that, we held a session um, with some of these med students a few years ago to try to talk to them about, about radiation oncology and steer them that way. 
um, but we haven't done it in a while, but we need to talk to them sooner when they're in med school and talk to them and, and try to help steer them into that path. So come resident interview day, um, we see more students um, with that diversity. Great. I mean, you, thank you very much. And so you bring up some amazing points. It's never too early to engage. You can engage people in junior high school. Uh, and a lot of times, like I'm an otolaryngologist, and when I was in you know, high school, I didn't know what otolaryngology was. And, um, and the fact that you're reaching out and, and exposing them to radiation oncology, which is an amazing field. I didn't know much about it when I was in medical school. So some of the things that uh, many of you know that we have an annual uh, simulation festival at the Student National Medical Association. We have over 55 faculty, staff, chairs, and learners who go. And Dr. Chapman participated as well and, and, and met with diverse students from around the country to expose them to Michigan medicine. We also have a health equity visiting clerkship, which we partner with the departments to bring individuals, anyone interested in health equity, to come here. And we actually give them a stipend. We give them some mentorship. Uh, every year, we've been very successful in matching uh, some of those individuals. This year, we've had we have close to 20 people from the outside coming here to do a rotation. Uh, it's a very popular program, one of the, I would imagine one of the most popular in the country. So there are opportunities. If you have other ideas of how you want to reach back and to encourage people, we welcome your ideas. And also it's an opportunity for you to write a mini grant, you know, if you want to go into the junior high schools and mentor. It's really uh, important that we engage people and let them know that medicine and radiation oncology and, and otolaryngology is possible for them. So thank you very much. Thank you to our, our speakers. Uh, it was, it's amazing to get just a snippet of some of the things that we are doing here at Michigan Medicine. We're going to play a video now uh, from uh, uh, nursing, and then we're going to ask our panelists to come up while this video is being played for our next one. What made you come to the University of Michigan? Why are we so important? And it has always been because I see the diversity. I see the passion. I see education. I see so many different people have the same compassion and have the same love for nursing. If you had a first career somewhere else or you did a traditional four-year college right out of high school like no matter what your background is you you'll fit in here it's nice to see our workforce in the mixture of old people experienced but we also have young people with the energy i think that kind of mixture is very healthy for our working environment you have them to become like a melting pot now and i look at that and i smile because now when everyone come in they see me, they see Darice, they see the uniqueness of the University of Michigan Nursing. Having those connections, having people that you can lean on and working in an environment that you feel supported by your coworkers was huge. Even though it was terrifying going from a small place to such a large university, it was comforting to know that I wasn't alone and there's all kinds of support available. I found that we all, all of us play a part in that. Not a single case can go by without all parts moving together. You're honored, and that's an excellent word, you're honored to be part of that for these families. Just be the best that you can be, that you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I'm doing something really good for people. And that this is what you're supposed to do, and this is what you were made for, and you're gonna love it. Just one example of the great things we're doing. So now uh, we're going to have a, a, a panel discussion uh, leading across difference, a panel, because uh, that's the title of our, the theme of our symposium today. And so we're going to welcome our panelists to our stage. Um, the stage is small but the people are huge in all their efforts. And I'll introduce them to you.
from left to right. Uh, it's uh, Sonia Jacobs. She is the Chief Organizational Learning Officer and the Senior Director in Human Resources and the Director of Faculty and Leadership Development for the University of Michigan Medical School uh, and Michigan Medicine and I think the whole university. <laughs> so she is, she is every woman. And sitting next to her is uh, Pedro uh, Corachides. Did I get it close right? Sorry, Pedro. Uh, and he's a project manager in office for the patient experience. I mentioned him earlier today. Uh, he has done amazing work with helping us with our health equity uh, index for LGBTQ patients. Uh, and, and that partnership is greatly appreciated. All the work that we do in OHE is a partnership. I couldn't do it all of, uh, by our, ourselves with our own team, so I really appreciate that. Next to him is Sean Dr Dwyer, who's the Executive Director of University Hospital and the um, um, Cardiovascular Center. Uh, and next to her is Farami Okanami. He's an Assistant Professor in Family Medicine, Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and he's also the director of our medical student programs in the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. I mentioned him earlier. So what we'll do is we'll have uh, some questions that we'll have uh, at least a few of you reflect upon and, and answer, and you can go in any order that you wish. And so I'm gonna start with, what is one way that you, in your current role, work across differences? In anyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am really happy to be here. As I think about um, working across differences, I think in my role, I get a chance to interact with many different people at many different levels from many different uh, backgrounds. And when we think about you know, diversity, there's 31 different attributes. So if you think about those different attributes, every single day I get an opportunity to experience someone who may not have walked the same path um, that I have walked. Uh, but I think about the work that I do as a staff member uh, and working with faculty. That's an example of working across differences um, on a daily uh, basis. Also being able to work with uh, staff and faculty uh, who represent different generations um, and hearing from them uh, what interests them, what concerns uh, them, and each and every experience uh, makes me uh, better um, as an individual um, because there's learning uh, with everyone. I also think that when I have the opportunity to work across the different academic units, you know, I grew up in the health system uh, is what I uh, tell folks, and having the ability now for the last three years to work across the entire university has been a very great, a good experience uh, for me because there are many different perspectives out there and many different needs, and I have to avail myself of that world so that I can uh, better serve and better support. Thanks, Sonia. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, first of all, I want to say it's not often that I'm on a panel where we start with a group kind of hug, which is really awesome because <laughs> I love all these people. It's such a pleasure to be able to work with them. Um, in my role as a leader of the hospitals, I think it is a privilege, first of all, but it comes with great responsibility around thinking about what is it we're trying to accomplish um, and how do we get the most value from every single person that comes to work every day with the goal of really doing a great job. And uh, I've come to realize we have a long way to go on doing that, and that's inclusive of myself as a leader. So in my role, I think, um, and listening to the Department of Surgery um, presentation, there are many structural things that you can do and programs you can put in place. and. Um, and they're wonderful. And what I thought I might talk to you about is one of the things I see in my role um, as a leader in managing difference every day is really to think about it every day, be intentional about it every day, um, and try to be better every day. And in order to do that, um, 
I really try to be curious every day with the people I'm in the room with because um, I always have something to learn um, and they have more value to give. And so I've just learned a lot from many people by trying to listen. And for those of you who know me, that takes a lot of practice on my part. Um, but I think I'm getting better at it. And so I think part of the leader, you have to be willing to understand yourself, what your strengths are, where you're challenged, what your biases are, be willing to be uncomfortable about that, um, and to allow a group to be uncomfortable with that um, when conflict arises, because we get the best solutions when we can manage across that. So I see that as really a core competency of leaders managing across difference, but I don't think our culture is really very comfortable with that. So um, it's one of the things I'm really trying to uh, work on and see as my uh, role in particular lately. Thanks. I'm going to put my social work student hat on for a second and talk a little bit about uh, challenging the problem or the policy and not the person. Um, I think a lot of times, especially in today's climate, um, it ends up being about the relationship we have with the person and we shut doors and we close conversations because uh, we see it about, you know, having hatred against somebody as opposed to having, you know, a passion for trying to fix what the policy is, which really is the root cause of some of the things that we are seeing as problems nowadays. So when you're working in the office setting, when you're working on um, projects, trying to solve a problem, um, you have to look at the policies, you have to look at uh, what the problems are out there and not the people, because the people are the ones you have to work with in order to kind of find a solution for this stuff. Um, so, again, taking the emotions out of it, looking at the words and not the, not the relationships. I will piggyback on that to talk about the difference that I feel I, I work in. I have the opportunity to work with our medical students, and the medical students are often the ones that are a bit further along in understanding why diversity, equity, and inclusion is important. And they have a multitude of opinions and ideas as to how things should be, and they want them to be that way right now. I then also work with faculty, and as Wayne was saying earlier, faculty are often sometimes the most difficult ones to change, and I have to balance this struggle of being a faculty member, but also advocating for my students and trying to form this bridge that Phyllis talked about earlier to then allow them to not blame the person but blame the policy and the procedures that are in place because oftentimes the students feel as though we're not hearing them and they don't always see the work that's being done. They don't always see the impact that maybe things are having because it doesn't always tend to get to them right away. And then putting myself in their position as a young black disabled faculty member, I often feel the same way, but I have to do a better job of trying to continue to bridge those gaps in that communication as I'm trying to forge my path in this same system where people don't necessarily look like me as I'm getting further along. So I think that I've had a wonderful opportunity to try to be on both sides of the fence, so to speak, and, and leverage the different sort of demographics that I fall into while trying to uplift everyone at the same time and, and make it clear that we are doing the work even though it's not always visible, the impact right away. So, so thank you. So some of the things I heard there is, uh, which are true to our institution, that sometimes people don't feel that they're being heard. And one best practice I heard there is to kind of have some genuine curiosity uh, and as we are leaders in listening, that this is uncomfortable. If you are feeling uncomfortable in these situations, I think that's um, uh, valid, um, and it happens uh, to all of us, uh, and that's where we grow uh, when we're in our, outside of our comfort zone. So having said that, I want to know more about your personal and professional growth um, from working with others of different backgrounds. You know, what have you uh, experienced and how has that changed you uh, either personally and or professionally? I imagine you do things differently now than you did five years ago. All right, the boss is telling me to go first, so I should probably <laughs> listen to her. Um, I took a shameless plug, if you will, for one of the courses OHE does in intercultural awareness. Um, and one of the key things you learn is across cultures, um, we all speak differently, we all see differently, 
um, our behaviors are different. And I think um, in a diverse workplace, we have to acknowledge those and be open to those and understand that when people are perhaps yells, you know, screaming at us, they're not mad at us, um, or perhaps if they're not making eye contact with us, it's because those are their cultural norms and it has nothing to do how they want to engage with us on a project or solving a problem. So keeping in mind those things um, and looking at them and identifying them um, is important because then that helps, again, to build those relationships that we have to uh, continue to do if we want to get anywhere with the things we're working on. Um, when I first thought about this question, I thought, oh, this would be the eye roll question for my children who, um, they're like, I'm always asking them, so what'd you learn? What do you want to learn to, what'd you learn today? And they're, you know, they're in their 20s. They're like, mom, I didn't learn anything today. But <laughs> they did. You're always learning something, whether it's positive or not, every day. And I think the thing that has been the best for me is that by getting to know more people and expanding my um, network and being open uh, to people that are different than me, that I just get more joy out of it. Um, I, I really believe that, and I think I'm more empathetic, and so I think I'm you know, coming into my own a little bit more. I think I'm better for it. And I would tell you a little story that at the Women's uh, Leadership Conference last year, we had the speaker, her name was Lavi Ajayi, and um, she was really fantastic. If you haven't seen her TED Talk, you should see it. But she's a young black woman, um, and I watched all of the black women in the audience sort of come to the front. Um, where's Clarissa? She, they're all coming up to the front and they were so excited to hear her speak and I thought, I have never heard of this woman. I don't know who she is. And she was so awesome. She was so awesome and she has a podcast called uh, Rants and Randomness. So she's funny too. Um, and I have to tell you, I started listening to her and I've learned a lot. And I find myself just really uh, being more curious, asking more questions. Um, and so. I don't know, I, I find it to be fun. I just wanted to say, you know, everyone's very serious. Um, but I really do think that um, you can just have more fun and be a better, well-rounded person um, if you embark on this journey. Now, I must say, there are lots of people who don't hold my values, my beliefs, all kinds of stuff, and that really is uncomfortable. But you know what, it's not the worst thing in the world, right? It gives us perspective and, um, and I think having multiple perspectives and looking at a problem or an issue or whatever just uh, makes you better able to partner with people to get to success. And that's where the work part comes in because we're trying to change everything here, everything, you know? And change involves people. And people have to want to move forward with you. So if you can see multiple perspectives and garner those connections, then you're more likely to have a change that's sustainable. And, you know, as she said, it's fun when you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Something that I'll answer the same question by adding another question to it. He asked, what do we get by working with people with different cultures? I'm going to add, what do I get by working with people in the same culture? Because I worked with the Office of Patient Experience a few weeks ago and we did a panel on patient experience and we talked about cultural humility. Now people know about cultural competence, but not everyone is familiar with cultural humility. And one of the major tenets of that is that it requires an egolessness. And so I said people of the same cultures because I would say that disability is, is a culture that people talk about. In the time that I've been here, I've been able to interact with so many different people with disabilities that I learned so much about disabilities that I didn't know anything about, right? And that is something that would be seen as the same culture. So we might realize that if people in the same culture can have such very differences, then imagine what things are like from different cultures. And if you come in with this egolessness and acknowledge that you may have a blind spot, as Van Jones talked about in his talk yesterday, and you come in to say that that blind spot is something that, even though it's not my fault, if I'm not, if I don't come in with an ego, to acknowledge that someone may know something that I do not know, and that there may be someone even in the same group of people I've been working with, that if I haven't had a conversation about some of these difficult things, I may not know the way that they perceive this. You need people to want to then work with you to then implement change. 
But if you don't understand what other people think, what other people feel, how they see things, you're never going to be able to get to that change. And you may not realize why it is that people make the decisions that they make. And so by working with people of different cultures and the same culture, you learn about things that you didn't otherwise know, which to bring it back to medicine and healthcare, right, is this Michigan Medicine Group, we're all here for patient care at the end of the day. And if we're not able to do that with our colleagues, with our peers, then when we have a dynamic between the patient and the provider or the nurse and the provider or the clerk or the person that's making the parking tickets, that is all part of the patient experience that we don't understand why maybe someone is you know, not looking at you in the eye or why they're speaking loudly. And so having these interactions teaches each one of us a little bit more about the way people live and that how they make their decisions as well. Uh, I'll piggyback on um, what I'm hearing around uh, curiosity and engaging voices. I have uh, the great pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Brown on an effort that looks at um, advancing Asians in leadership roles. And I explored that topic a, a while ago um, uh, through my master's thesis, but it has been most recent where you can sit in a room with people of different backgrounds and cultures and understand, one, their perspective, but also see the commonality with my own self. Um, and so one of the things that I've learned through this effort is we share very common values. I think about the impact that their family upbringing had on them and their careers and the decisions that they've made. I have great appreciation for humility and the way in which one might enter into the world and into the space and, and what they bring. And so it has been one of the most rewarding um, efforts. I have learned a lot. I think I have grown a lot uh, professionally and it makes me even more curious. And so where we could have had assumptions about one with the eye contact that, as you've talked about, I have a better understanding of where that comes from and the extent to which we can reach out uh, with people with different backgrounds, but also see the commonalities, the better we are as human beings. And I'm just grateful uh, for that opportunity. So I look for those uh, opportunities to learn and grow professionally as well as personally. Thank you. And so some of the things I gathered from uh, what you said, all of you, is that we're all learners in this and that it does take some humility to do this. Now, even when we're uh, talking to someone more junior to us or as a physician talking to a patient, we're learning about their experience. And so to be curious and be in the learner mode is important. Uh, and also heard that we carry multiple identities. Someone may look like you, but we're all different. We're not exactly the same. And so getting to know people who even may look like us um, and that the success of this involves all of the people. And if we really want to be uh, the institution of choice for people to work, learn, and get their care, then we need to value all of the people here. So thank you very much. So having said that, um, if you had unlimited resources, time, money, and people, I know it doesn't exist, um, but if you did, what would you implement to help us build relationships that strengthen our community? Shoot, that's fine. So <laughs> I, I always wait to allow other people to speak first because everyone that knows me knows that if you let me start, I just might keep going. So I'm, I'm trying to, to sort of temper my own enthusiasm by allowing others to go first. I'm already getting the wrap-up box right here. So if resources were unlimited right now, I know that we all have in our answers, I think we're all doing a wonderful job of trying not to say the same thing that the other person is saying. But I will say something that hopefully isn't the same thing someone else will say, and that's why I'll put it out there. If resources were unlimited, I would build a health system that is actually inclusive and accessible. Now, we are here to care for individuals in need. Most people that come into the health system have some sort of disability, whether it is temporary or permanent. Yet this facility, this structure that we work in, that we live in, is not one that is automatically accessible. And that is something that our learners are seeing, 
our patients are seeing, the visitors are seeing. And if resources were unlimited, the reason why I think that this would build connections is because what we've done with disabilities, we've created this separation between patient and provider in a way that is false. As Dr. Brown mentioned, I'm an assistant professor of family medicine and of physical medicine and rehabilitation here, and I'm a provider that sees patients. Yet 99% of the time as I move through the health system, people assume I'm a patient. Now, the funny thing is, I had an MRI last night, and I actually was a patient, and that's the first time that someone that saw me asked me if I was getting off my shift. And I thought, this is hilarious. The only time that I've, <laughs> I've actually been, like, leaving, and I was in a sweatpants and a sweatshirt leaving an MRI, and she goes, are you getting off your shift? And I was like, well, but then I could be in my white coat, and someone asks me if I'm lost, and they're trying to show me somewhere. But, <laughs> but, but I say this because if we acknowledge that disability is something that we are all going to experience and we build structures to allow everyone to be there. I tell people that putting a ramp in a building doesn't mean that someone that could have used the stairs can't use the ramp. But when you have stairs, someone that needs a ramp can't get in. And we talk about trying to create access and pipelines and allowing people to get to places, but when people can't get into the building, they're never going to have a seat at the table. And so if we could create a health system that is actually accessible, and accessible means so much more, and that's what I mean that I've learned over this year. It's not just physical accessibility, because disability isn't just physical or visible that you can see. But there's so many other needs that individuals have that disability has this stigma that automatically it means less than or unable. And I don't believe that. But all of the different things that people have, that the needs that they have to be able to access something, if we created a system that was actually accessible and inclusive, our patients, our learners, our visitors, everybody would be able to benefit from it. So. I'm going to keep on the facilities discussion. And, uh, you know, one thing I think I miss from being a college student, and I see it now in grad school, is the physical spaces that are created for students to come together and talk about ideas and celebrate differences. And, and so, you know, if I was a uh, leader of, the world, of Michigan Medicine one day, I would build a cultural center for staff members, for employees, right? Every company I've ever worked at, it's kind of like we celebrate diversity, we talk a lot about it, we do all these courses, but we never get people the space to actually do this um, and come together and talk together, put different flags up, stuff like that, right? Um, so a place that we can all come together, celebrate diversity in a physical space, because a tangible, I think, carries a lot of weight. I mean, the message that we always try to try to set out is important, but, um, you know, it's just coming together. I was talking to somebody, uh, interpreter services the other day, and in their office setting, um, they all kind of are representative of the different cultures that they're there for, and so she's, it's not uncommon for us to be uh, exchanging a bite of our lunch from, you know, our own unique cultures that we belong to, and we're trying different foods and different things, um, and that's pretty neat. Um, and they organically can do that in their office space, so if we do that for the broader community, I think that would just be awesome. I want to uh, shift from facilities and space and talk about the people and development. So if money uh, was no issue, time, um, I would make sure that everyone had an opportunity for development, that there are no barriers to your development and to your growth. And you have an opportunity to build skill, to be prepared for any position that came available in the organization. And that we allowed for you to have access to those opportunities in a way that we don't currently have as well. And that's a system uh, thing. But if we all have an opportunity to build skills and making sure that we have the right people in the right places at the right time, we will build and strengthen our community because that provides opportunities for others with different perspectives to be in different places uh, to build the great university that we have and can have uh, in the future. So mine is all about putting the investment in our greatest resource, which is our people. I think we went in the right order. Because uh, we need the facility and we need the people to be developed and I think I would add that we need them to have time. Um, it is such a precious resource and it's for everybody. But what I see is that the pace of change, the workload, things are so busy that 
pausing to be able to work through things together, to enjoy each other's difference in a space that might be created um, is extremely challenging. Um, so I would, I would give us some time. And I, I would also put some supports in place um, for people to actually have some facilitated conversations on a regular basis with people who are really skilled at that. I think we have some here, and I'll tell you, if I could take them into every conversation I was having, um, I would take them. <laughs> I mean, there are just certain people that are really helpful to make that less uncomfortable. I mean, some of them are sitting here. Um, and then I think a couple of other things I would do is I would shut off email for problem solving. Amen? Okay. Um, nothing gets solved complicated on email, and there's way too much of it. And problems are really solved by people face to face, and it is never the technical solution. We have plenty of good solutions technically. It's all about making the change, and we got to do that together. So email would go off, maybe even you know, if I was queen for a day, maybe for a little while. Um, I think the other thing I would do, and this is sort of facilities, but um, is I would put in much more video conferencing because we all can't be in the same place at the same time. And I find that we try to compensate by being on the phone, but it's really different to understand intent and um, emotion on the phone. So, right, this is all about how do we work through difference. It's really hard to do when you're not together, when you're not on the, can't see each other, and when you have no time. So that's what I would add to the secret sauce up here. So there are ingredients for advancing this, this space, space at the table, and also space to come together to celebrate us. And also cyberspace. I'm going to put uh, Sean's oh, thing down. to video conference because we don't always have the time because email doesn't replace the individual and the people. Uh, so no barriers to development. And um, and so it, I'll share from OHEY. Uh, we actually have one of our dashboard um, goals is to have 100% of our staff participate in a professional development activity every year. So you and your areas as leaders can be intentional about uh, what you do. We actually even give them resources. So they're all accountable. They're hearing me say it is true. And we, we really do want them all to do it because that's going to help them out and time to pause and enjoy that space and each other. So that's really important. So how do you all celebrate other cultures or provide recognition across uh, roles at Michigan Medicine? And is this formal or informal? How do, you, how, do you, how do you celebrate cultures and acknowledge them? Or appreciate them? So uh, I'll uh, say one, I don't think I do enough. Okay, so I'll acknowledge that. But I have a multicultural calendar that uh, Loretta Thomas passes out every year. And so somebody's got to raise the mantle, and maybe it's me, to continue to distribute those now that she has uh, retired. But it's been very informative to learn about different cultures and to be able to reflect on those uh, in the moment. And I thought about uh, today, Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. OK? Uh, the holiest day. Uh, uh, for our Jewish community, and I think about what can I do to want try to learn a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, about it, and it's just trying to be more intentional about asking questions related to one's background and or culture, so that we can acknowledge uh, and celebrate that. And then just one simple thing that I do uh, regularly do is around the holidays, I'm mindful that not everyone celebrates the same holidays that I do, but to acknowledge those that do in a way that respects their beliefs and background, as in, you know, Hanukkah. And I just think we have to do those things. That just makes us a better community uh, and a more aware and uh, respectful community. I thought about this uh, literally, and uh, I 
I fill out a Making a Difference Award for people with the Michigan Medicine and then for the equivalent on the university side. Um, and I make sure that the wording and the words I use are, are representative of the people that I'm writing one. So if I submitted one for uh, somebody on campus and um, they use they them pronouns and I made them pull the uh, nomination back because I think they'd written some script and they'd used the wrong pronoun. I said, hey, you can't mispronounce somebody. So, um, but that aside, I think just taking the second to write something tangible that somebody can get um, goes a long way. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times you'll submit them and you'll just get a quick email back from somebody that says, hey, thank you very much for taking the time to do that. It doesn't always happen, um, so I appreciate that. And I think that just goes a long way, again, when we talk about building bridges and making connections with people. Um, it goes huge, 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 huge thing to just kind of send that out um, and, and write this stuff to people. This, the system's in place, so let's use them. Um, I think this is hugely important, and while I know that in my head, um, the important of, importance of recognizing and celebrating, um, it is not my strength. Um, and, you know, my assistant knows that, people in my department know that, I'm on to the next thing. And so I, this is where I have to use structure, right? So because I have to remind myself, so I have literally a weekly uh, worksheet that I use around key things that I want to make sure I remember to do. And saying thank you and celebrating um, is on there. And I'm, I'm really good at it now. I'm getting much better. So, uh, you know, I've written probably over the last year over 100 thank you notes personalized. Um, we do this on our structured rounds. We round at least once or twice a week. We ask for who should be recognized for what. We write personalized letters. We send them to people's homes. I think people need to have recognition by the leadership that we understand what you did and we appreciate it. Um, so those are some of the things um, that we're doing and I think we're also trying to make sure that we listen to what people are telling us when we actually have some of these conversations. And uh, so for instance, when I met with uh, my group recently, you know, they said, Sean, you know, we talk about these issues but we don't talk about them enough. So why don't we come together and do something monthly? And I'm looking at Michelle because she organizes all of it, bless you. Um, and so we do, we come together and we celebrate our differences and we learn together. And I think those are the kinds of things that they take time, but they're really important. And for me, I have to structurally build them in because uh, that's just not part of my base. I'm going to second what Sean said and, and acknowledge that this is something that is a, is a learning point for me and a growing point. I think that sometimes when you do the work, it's easy to think that you're, you're good enough, right? You know, here you are in the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion, you know, your title says that you do this, so you must do it well, and you forget that you yourself still need practice at doing it. And I have a few tangible real life examples that just happened recently, because we have a series of ways that we evaluate our medical students. And as I said, the medical students are very vocal in terms of how they feel about things. And it looked to them as if we failed to acknowledge that we started their clinical rotation calendar during the Jewish High Holidays. And it was something that has been happening and medical students year in and year out comment on the timing of their rotations and how that affects them and where they can go. And you have to realize that these are students that feel as though if they don't go to the first day of a rotation, they're from the first year of medical school already terrified about where they're going to match. And so you imagine trying to tell them that it's okay if you need to observe a holiday that you can do that. Same thing happened at another student who's a Seventh-day Adventist, and we have exams for them over the weekends. So the exams open up on Friday and close Sunday night. And so the student was talking about how essentially she loses an entire day of studying if she observes the Sabbath. And so these are things that acknowledging, not just acknowledging other people's cultures, but acknowledging them and seeing how the structures that we have set up don't always factor that in. It's one thing to acknowledge something, it's something else to implement a change that says we value what it is that you are bringing and we're trying to create access for you. So when I, when I said accessibility, I think that once again, people think about physical accessibility, right? But you talked about 
the video conferencing, right? We talk about digital accessibility, but accessibility is just giving someone the opportunity to do what it is that they can do. And if a student feels as though they don't have the opportunity to observe their faith, if a student feels as though they don't have the opportunity to do as well as they can on an exam because of the way that we have structured it, I think that we are not fully sort of doing the due diligence and the justice for them. I will say that our institution does listen to them, and Dean Mangulkar does a wonderful job of trying to make sure that with the variety of cultures that exist here, because we then, we, we, we include people. We actually invite and recruit medical students from diverse backgrounds, but as I believe it was Wayne said, recruitment is one thing, retention is another. And so if we bring people into a structure that then doesn't value them when they get here, we're being disingenuous by saying we care about that, but then not creating a structure that allows them to continue being what it was that we valued when they came here. But I, I'm so proud to say that of the different things that I've seen since I've been here on faculty for only just a year and a half, I do see from, from Dr. Rungi to Dr. Bradford to Dr. Brown to Dean Maran Gulkar that they care about those things and it's not easy to then make systemic changes that acknowledge those things, but they truly are trying to listen to everybody's voice and to create structures specifically for our students that allow them to, to be who they truly are and to bring all parts of themselves to their learning environment here. Great, and so some things that I heard there is, you know, kind of continuing our own self-learning journey, uh, asking questions about experience and acknowledging people, to use structure to complement your strengths, and that we're always learning and growing no matter what our titles are uh, and where we are in the hierarchy and listening and valuing people. So with that, I'm gonna transition to the last question, and we have five minutes, so I'm gonna call this a lightning round uh, for you guys. Uh, with one minute apiece uh, for your answers. And, but I'm gonna give you a hard question, I think. And so since we talk about listening and value, how do you encourage people to speak up, to, to vocalize what they are concerned about, especially at times when there can be power differentials? And if you have time in your 60 seconds, if you can tell me about how that impacted you yourself. 60 seconds, go. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it there really quickly. Um, one is creating the space so you can have that conversation. So making sure that whatever the issue is, it's focused on the behaviors and not the person. Okay? Because when you can describe the impact that behavior has on you, a person can receive that. And I think that is critical for dialogue. She did great. I, 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 I will say that from the position in which I sit, no pun intended, I, I think that what we need to do is not just give people the space to then, to then be courageous and say something or have agency when the, their, sort of their hierarchy differences, but I think taking that and leveraging the position that you are in to then demonstrate to that person it's important. Because you can let someone talk to you and listen to them in this circle, but if you then don't represent them at the highest level when you have an opportunity to, I think you miss it. So students don't always get to speak to the dean, but when you have your five minutes, if you make sure that one of those minutes is used to then say something that that student or that staff member would have wanted to say that they couldn't say because they weren't yet at that table, you are then leveraging the position that you have to demonstrate that those words that they have got all the way to the top. I would say it's not what you say, it's what you do. Create the space, put the arm out, and help them to speak up. It's a, not an easy thing to do, um, and you have to make that okay, and you have to thank them, and you have to not let there be any retribution. You need to protect them when they do speak up, and it's not popular. Mine is uh, mental health, and just from the standpoint of for so many years I was fighting uh, depression and anxiety, and uh, we don't normalize, as we say, talking about addressing these things, and um, you get so much courage, and you find so much uh, strength in yourself to go talk to other people at different levels of the organization with people that may not agree with your beliefs, your values. Um, because you can work through those emotions of anxiety and fear that you might have as a result of 
of um, any barriers that you're putting up for yourself. Um, and then once you're in a good spot for yourself, helping other people that are in that, in that space, right? Meeting them where they're at and understanding where they're at emotionally and helping them through that um, so that they too can find the courage and the strength to engage. Great, you all did amazing. I don't think anyone took more than 60 seconds. So thank you. So in that, you, you guys talked about courage to meet people where they are, the space for listening and advocacy and lever leveraging your privilege. And also as leaders, we need to uh, take that to our actions and behaviors that's gonna change our, our culture. So thank you all. And let's give another round of applause to our panelists. And I actually want to thank David because every time he summarized, it's as if we gave him notes, but we didn't. And, <laughs> and he like, put it together in this amazing sentence each time. I was like, well done. Even that cyberspace thing that you did, well done. I have certain talents. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And so now what I'd like to do is to invite Patty Andreski and Phyllis uh, once more because we're going to give another round of awards. Yes, Clarissa. Oh, so we're going to do a 15-minute break, and then we're going to give some awards. So you have to come back because you want to see these people get the awards. So 15-minute break. Thank you.
So we uh, will wrap up our break and we welcome you to return to your seats and we will proceed with the rest of our program. We're going to show you another video from nursing about barriers uh, to nursing uh, and then I will be back right after that. So we'll queue up the video. Hey, I'm Marissa. Hi, I'm Brooke. It's nice, nice to meet, to meet you. you. My name is Lee. Chase. Nice it's nice to meet you here. Hi, David. Hi, Tiffany. Good seeing you. Mm, you too. Michelle. Corey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Hi. Hi, I'm Natalie. Natalie Courtney. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> We have to be flexible. We have to be flexible and adaptable in our environments because they change. They're so fluid every day. Always. I think nurses, new nurses particularly, they have a harder time. I remember being a brand new nurse and I remember being absolutely terrified, moving to a new town, starting at a new hospital, everything was different. And it becomes, becomes very intimidating like when you're dealing with surgeons or the doctors who are frustrated, but really it's because they have a common goal. We all have a common goal. Some surgeon said something that just like hit me to the core, but I would keep a straight face. If you stand there and you're stern for your patient the next time, they're like, oh, she's cool. <laughs> Which is intimidating as a new nurse. I want to be the one who has the answer, especially for my patients. And so to have to sit there and say, you know, I don't have that answer for you right now, but let me see what I can do was a really hard moment for me, I think. Of course, as everybody knows, I came from China. Mm -hmm. English is my second language. But actually, it was a little barrier for me at the very beginning when I started to be a nurse. Constantly, every day, you know, um, taking on new patients, and then we don't know where they come from, their backgrounds are, how they look at me as, as a nurse taking care of them. We wouldn't have gone into nursing if we didn't enjoy learning new things, because every day is so different on our floors. But you have to kind of be OK with feeling uncomfortable. You know, dealing with some of the, the stuff from other people makes it really hard to enjoy coming to work, but when you come to work, you're, tr you're working with people that need you, and yes. it, the other stuff, sometimes you just let it roll off of you, even though it's not ideal. It doesn't really have an effect on how your patients are receiving care. Yeah, and, and you're gonna meet those people, you're gonna work with them, you're gonna take care of them, they're gonna be the mother, father, sister of this patient, it's somebody's gonna have a very very bad day and you're gonna be their outlet but just take it as it's just this day and it's just this one person and then the next day you're gonna be good I have days that make me really feel down but I have days that my patients really appreciate my care and regardless of my, the color of my skin I really believe that my language the way I look doesn't matter like the way I'm going to take care of you. And I would say almost all of the time, by the end of the day, they appreciate having me as a best center taking care of them. And so now, being seasoned, I remember. And I try to remind myself every day, we won't improve unless we support each other. Being a new nurse is to have someone to back you up and to ask for help if you need it. Because you want to do it all, and you want to be good at everything all the time, and you just can't. You, we are all human beings, and we have to acknowledge our own vulnerabilities in order to be there for our patients in the best way. Our nursing colleagues are doing amazing things and so we can learn from them and from everyone at Michigan Medicine. So all those things are important for me as a surgeon and how I interact with them and with uh, my learners and patients and and residents. So next what we're going to do actually is we're going to, um, I, I want to invite Patty Andreski and, uh, and um, Phyllis Bachman because we're going to give another round of the champions for promoting positive culture at Michigan Medicine. And this round is for departments or units that have more than 50 staff and less than 500. Yes, there is a group that has more than 500. Uh, and so the next award for the champion for promoting positive culture at Michigan Medicine goes to Mishar. And the diversity, equity, and inclusion lead there is Latonya Barry Hill. So come on up. <laughs> we have our photographer. Oh, there we are. He's, he's on cue. And their net promoter score was 12.7. So another amazing score. We'll take a picture.
And the next one goes to the Canton Health Center Services. The diversity, equity, and inclusion lead there and driver is Rusty Ward. And the lead for UMMG is Steve Vinson. And they have like probably one of the highest net promoter scores. I think Delta would love this score too, 31.5. Come on. You wanna come, Steve? Come on up. And one more in this category uh, is for patient food and nutrition services, and the DI lead is Erica Raymond, and their net promoter score is 12.4. Mm -hmm. Anyone here from patient food and nutrition services that want to come up? Yeah, come on up. So uh, now I'd like to welcome Tony Denton. He was our Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, UM Health System. He's also my boss. If you have feedback, you can give it to him. <laughs> so welcome, Tony. I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, thank you, David. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for what you do uh, each and every day uh, to make our organization more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Just want to make a, a couple of comments because um, this is such an endearing and important um, place for me, a special place, the University of Michigan and Michigan Medicine. And I want to say to you, uh, each day, every day, uh, we are privileged to see the efforts and the benefits of what's becoming a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment, inclusive workforce, inclusive workplace, and a learning environment. And as we work to achieve a vision of a high reliability organization, it will be important for us to frame the goals and objectives of DEI as a part of that conversation, where we expect respect, we expect teamwork in our journey of continuous improvement our ability to hear all perspectives and make sure we have multiple viewpoints will be vital, absolutely vital to our success and legacy of excellence in all that we do, all that we seek to do in the future for the communities which we serve. Now, much of that credit for where we are today goes to you and those that could not be here, and I want to say thank you because it is a journey and it requires teamwork, respect, cooperation, collaboration, all those words that bind us together on that journey. But I also want to thank you for what you are continuing to do, because this day, like many of these days, are foundations of what we can accomplish when we work together. And so I want to say thank you and go blue. Uh, it is now my privilege to introduce our special guest and keynote speaker, Lenora Billings-Harris a diversity and inclusion strategist who specializes in helping organizations make diversity and inclusion a competitive advantage by disrupting bias. She is the author of two books and is included among the top 100 thought leaders on diversity by the Society of Human Resource Management. Lenora is a past president of the Global Speakers Federation and was recently inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame. I didn't know that there was a speaker hall of fame, uh, but that just tells you um, you have a great treat in store. A few of Lenora's clients include NASA, Genentech, Ritz-Carlton Hotels, Toyota, West Point, Disney, 
University of Washington School of Medicine, as well as numerous professional associations. Additionally, Lenora serves on the adjunct faculty of the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and the advisory council of the School of Communication at High Point University. Quite the traveler, Ms. Billings Harris has presented to audiences on six continents and in 41 countries, with intriguing engagements in the middle of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Finally, it should be noted that Lenore Billings Harris received her Master of Arts in Adult Education program from the greatest university in the world, our University of Michigan. <laughs> So, with an enthusiasm unknown to mankind, please listen, learn, and provide a rousing amazing blue welcome to one of our victors valiant, Lenora Billings Harris. Don't worry, this is a temporary disability. And I figured it would be okay to come here today wearing this medical boot because if something happened, this is the best place for it to happen to get care. <laughs> it was March of 1994. I had been invited to speak in Johannesburg, South Africa. I had been there several times before I started going after Nelson Mandela was freed from prison in 91. But this time was different. You see, in March of 1994, it was a month before Mr. Mandela would become president. It was a month before democracy would reach South Africa. So it was different because everyone was afraid. Everyone feared that there would be violence and death because no African country had ever transitioned to democracy without violence and death. I hadn't made a commitment to do diversity and inclusion work, and we didn't even have the word inclusion back then, it was just diversity, but I was really fighting doing this work. My background was training and development in HR, and so I was there to lead a full day leadership development program. I was in a room a, a little bit smaller than this, but there were going to be 60 automotive executives. Now, when I was working here at U of M, eventually one of the executives at General Motors stole me away to work for them, delivering uh, workshops and seminars. So I had an automotive background. I was excited that I was going to speak to these automotive ex executives in South Africa. So I'm in the room and I'm setting up because it was a full day workshop, a lot of interaction and engagement. And I had been told that it was all gonna be men because this was 1994, not very many women had reached executive levels. And I assumed there would be no black people in the audience because Black folks in South Africa had certainly not riven, uh, risen to those levels just yet. But interestingly enough, the very first person to walk into the room was a woman. I was so excited. So I put down what I was doing, the things that I was putting on the tables, and I walked over to her and I said, hi, my name is Lenora, welcome. She didn't shake my hand. She wouldn't give me eye contact. She proceeded to pick up her name badge and she sat at the table as far away from me as she could possibly get. Now I was not focused on what was happening in the country at that moment. I was only focusing on what was supposed to happen in the room. So I made a mental note. Perhaps she's a very reserved conservative South African. I'll make sure I don't call on her unless she volunteers. I did notice that her name was Annie. We're gonna push the pause button right about now. I know you're wondering what happened to Annie, but we'll get back to her, I promise. So let me share with you a few things before we get fully engaged in my talk today. 
I was asked to give you some tools and techniques on how to take action in the world of DE&I. I was informed that all, if not most, if not all of you have taken unconscious bias sessions, maybe one, maybe two, several have read books, so I don't need to teach you about unconscious bias. So we're gonna jump right into taking action. However, because I have such a short time with you, I really wanted to leave you with more resources. So on the slide, you can take out your smartphone and take a picture of this slide. It'll take a picture of the QR code and take you right to the hidden page on my website that's just for you. You don't have to put your email address or anything like that in it, just because the page is just for you. You don't need to download the materials for this session, it's really to embellish what I have shared with you and so that you can have some worksheets uh, to use what I will be sharing with you. Additionally, on the table is a postcard that has the uh, mnemonic that I'm gonna be sharing with you in a little while called Be Basic, so make sure you take one of those. And there's also a blank worksheet that you will need once you start applying the STOP technique. Now, if you didn't get a chance to take a picture of this or to write down the website, don't worry, because it is gonna come up in several other slides, just in case. So to start, I have a question for you. Why do you suppose it is for most people, probably not you in this room because you're all already engaged in DE&I, but why do you suppose it is for so many people, it's uncomfortable, scary, hard to talk about diversity, inclusion, equity, or bias. Why do you suppose that is? Now what I wanna do is gonna give you about 20 seconds to share with people at your team, your table team, why you think it's difficult for people to talk about this subject. Just share a word, a phrase. Why do you suppose it's hard? Go for it. Okay, so if we were in a longer workshop, I would pull many of the answers from you. But as you can imagine, I've asked this question many times. And the answers tend to be the same. So as you look at this slide, see if your answer is up there or something close to it. Right? Folks will say, I don't know what to say. I might say the wrong thing. Some people say, well, it's not about me, because we do have some folks that do not understand that diversity is about all of us, right? And usually middle-aged white men think it isn't about them. It's our job to help them know that it's about all of us. But nevertheless, people are uncomfortable about this elephant in the room called diversity, equity, and inclusion. So my intention today is to share with you a couple of ways that you can continue your journey in understanding people different than you, and you can share it with other people. Then secondarily, what do you do when the most well-intentioned people open mouth and insert foot? They say something that doesn't sit well with you. I find people end up saying nothing because they don't know what to say. So I was sharing a little bit earlier that I'm so glad that I'm following the panel because so much of what they shared is what I'm going to share with you, except I'm going to give you a structure that hopefully will make it easy for you to remember. So because we're afraid to say the wrong thing when we're interacting with people different than us, or we don't think it involves us, we have a tendency to go hang out with people just like us, right? Then when we get to those people just like us, isn't it interesting how we start complaining about those other people? Now I'm a proud Wolverine, and I've been doing this work now for over 25 years. I gotta tell you though, when I meet somebody that went to that other school, my biases come up immediately. And then I have to decide, you know, everyone is, is allowed to have at least one mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But the point here is, is that it's natural for us to want to be around people just like us, but then we start speaking in generalities about people who are not just like us. And that does not ca uh, cause a very inclusive environment. With all the different organizations with whom I work, what I share with them is, you know, the real reason we're here is to get diversity of thought. And you can't get diversity of thought if you don't have diversity at the table. And diversity in more than the ways that you can see it, as you've heard other people say earlier. It needs to be diversity in many different ways. But our tendency is to fall into this culture of silence. So we have to move beyond that if we're going to be more inclusive. Because when you boil it down to why it is people are reluctant to embrace this topic and to explore it and to take sessions and to talk to people and have these community first Fridays, I love that. The reason sometimes people don't participate is because they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing and then they won't belong. Now you know better than others because of the training you've already taken that Maslow was almost right. I know all of you took Psych 101 at some point in time in your career, high school or college, and Maslow said the most basic need is food and water. But what scientists are realizing now is he was almost right. The most basic need is belonging before anything else. Belonging is so important, we will avoid doing things that would cause us not to belong. So if you think about that when you're interacting with other folks, realize that when we get rejected in some way, our brain equates it to physical pain. And I'm proud to say, I hope you know that because it's your research that found that out. Every time we get rejected in a big way or a small way, our brain equates it to physical change. So some folks don't feel rejection all that much. But other folks feel rejected or put down on a regular basis. So imagine what that says to them. So someone earlier said well, it's not only about attracting the talent but retaining it. People leave when they don't feel like they belong. And we live in a world now where we have what I call imitation belonging. Every time I see these two little babies, I think, oh my gosh, what are we doing to their brain? Because adults and young people feel that they are connected to all these different groups. You might have 2,000 people following you on Facebook, but that's not real belonging. Because in a time of crisis, what we know is people don't go to Facebook immediately. They try to find other human beings first. And then they try to find food and shelter, etc. So we have to break this silence. That's what we in this room have to work at doing. Create that space where people are comfortable enough to break that silence because bias is normal. It's normal because every human being has it, but the folks that you interact with don't necessarily know that. And so most people tend to think bias is a bad thing. Except bias is not a bad thing. Bias is a thought. What you do with that thought might give you a negative consequence, or it could be a positive one. It just depends. So if we can break that silence and give people some tools that they can use, then perhaps we can create that space of inclusion. So here's an example of what I mean. Now some of you may know her because we are at a school of medicine. You may know who this person is. Well, I was fortunate to be in the audience at Society of Human Resource Management, one of their conferences, and this person was the speaker. What most people noticed immediately was that she was a little person. And these were folks that in, in the audience that many of them were diversity practitioners, but still the conversation that I was hearing when she first came to the platform were all comments about her size. Because in her introduction, they hadn't yet told her, told the audience who she was, that was intentionally. They didn't tell her, tell us who she really was. My point is this, they were so focused on her size, they didn't necessarily notice who she really is. And who she really is is a pediatric surgeon that's world-renowned. 
Now, you might know her from The Little Couple, the TV show. But my point is, how much do we miss when we assume that people, because people look a certain way, that they must not be smart? And that comes up in so many different ways in how we interact with folks. Now, in the U.S., colorism is still alive and well, but not nearly as bad as it used to be back during Jim Crow time or before that. But colorism is something that's international. If you get to DC, go to the African American Museum and look at the brown bag exhibit. How many of you know what the brown bag test is? Okay, there's a few of you in the audience. So there's gonna be a, a fireside chat later and I'm gonna ask Clarissa to ask me to tell you what it is then because we don't have enough time right now, but I'll tell you what it is then, and, and you could certainly tell the people in your audience. But the point I want to make now is that colorism isn't something that's owned in the United States. What I have found in my travels is that colorism exists everywhere in the world, every country where there is a lot of diversity of skin tone. And my clients will often say, oh, we don't have the diversity issues you have in the U.S. because we're all, and then they'll say whatever the nationality is, Except if it's a place I haven't been before, I'll go early, a couple of days early, and do research by walking around. And inevitably what I find is the people with the darkest skins tend to have the lowest level jobs. Intentionally or not, the bias is there. So the question becomes, when you are interacting with a patient or when you're interacting with a colleague, does that bias come up for you? It doesn't make you a bad person, it just means that you have taken in information that is no longer useful, that you might need to say, hmm, need to put that one aside. Because intention is not enough. It's impact that makes the difference. Regardless of what your intentions are, and I believe that most people have good intentions when they're interacting day to day in the workplace, Still, that's just because your intentions are good, it isn't enough because I can't read your mind. And the other person can't read your mind either. So the more that we can realize that the world, we see the world the way we are, not the way the world is. And when we're interacting with others, we realize, oh, they're seeing the world the way they are. To give you an example, I'm a law and order junkie. Any version of law and order, I like to watch it. And as you know, in the beginning of law and order, there's always starts with a dead body. Right? And then two detectives come up and they kind of look at the situation and, and they tell the uniformed officers to canvas the area. And they're looking for eyewitnesses, right? They could find two or three eyewitnesses. And you have to watch the beginning of the show so you can see how different it is at the end of the show. So they might find two or three eyewitnesses, but the eyewitnesses don't tell them exactly the same thing. They never tell them exactly the same thing because each eyewitness saw the circumstance from their point of view, and they believe their point of view is right. So I know you've had a lot of training in unconscious bias, but I want to give you an exercise to do right now anyway. Shake the hand of one person at your table. Just shake the hand of one person at your table. If you're sitting at a table of, of uneven number, then you know, you'll work it out. Okay? So you're such a friendly group, I know you shook everybody's hand at your table. <laughs> I was watching you. <laughs> now, let me reframe this. Let's imagine that you are the manager who is interviewing a candidate. Now, you're gonna be the manager and the candidate at the same time, because here's what I want you to do. Shake that person's hand again, but this time, give them no eye contact and give them a dead fish handshake. <laughs> now, I'm watching you. You should see yourself. Some of you wouldn't even touch the other person. Because even if you were not born here in the U.S., because you're working here at U of M, you probably have figured out the right way to shake hands in Western culture. 
right? So on that first handshake, and you were smiling, and you were giving eye contact, is because you all have learned that in Western culture, you're supposed to give direct eye contact. Now, if it were a real introduction, you probably you would have stood up, because you were supposed to give direct eye contact, stand up, and have a firm handshake, right? Don't break their bones, but have a firm handshake. So we're taught that's the right way. And even though you understand different cultures, how often do we judge someone when they don't give us eye contact? And you talked about that a good deal this morning. But in, additionally, they give us that weak handshake. Now, I do this activity with healthcare professionals as well as all of my other groups. And I'm always concerned when I'm with healthcare professionals that so, when I say, what were you thinking? when that person gave you the weak handshake, I'm always concerned that somebody's gonna say, oh, I immediately thought they hurt their hand. That has not happened yet, <laughs> even among healthcare professionals. Now, you might eventually think that, but the first thing you're thinking is, uh, hiring this person, next, right? So you go through the interview process really fast because you don't want to waste your time with somebody you already have decided you're not gonna hire and you were basing that on your first impression, your bias about handshakes. They're not gonna fit here. When in fact, two thirds of the people on the planet intentionally give a weak handshake, do not get, uh, give eye contact, and many of them don't touch at all. But how often do we f slip into that confirmation bias? I already made up my decision about this person, and now let me just ask questions in a way that will confirm what I already was thinking rather than the other way around. Let me see if I can prove myself wrong is what we need to be doing. So just as a refresher with that handshake to remind you that we're all on this journey together. It is a continuous learning process. We don't take a pill and then we get it. It's constantly doing the work. So there are times, though, when we have microaggressions or micro inequities. And the only difference between the two is micro inequities are uh, subtle and it was unintentional. Microaggressions could be very intentional, but the result is the same. People are feeling, ouch, they're feeling that pain. So as these come up, think about have you ever e either experienced these questions or comments? Or do you, you know someone who has? And these are just a few examples of microaggressions. Now, I've got to make a comment about the hair one. There's two that are about hair. Now, one of them says, is that your real hair? If she paid for it, it's her real hair. <laughs> Why do we have to ask that question? Now, here's the thing is we often do or say these things when we're trying to make friends. So why can't we just say, ah, oh, your hair is beautiful and leave it at that. Then the other one that African-American women tell me they experience all the time. And I used to say, you see what I did. I don't experience this, <laughs> but I can't tell you that anymore because this summer in July, somebody actually put their hands in my little bit of hair that I have. <laughs> and here's the point. The person putting, the, what they, they say is, may I touch your hair, but their hands are already in your hair. And that's a power play, even though we haven't thought about it that way, because it's usually someone who is white touching someone who is black, who unconsciously knows they have the power to do that. So what would be wrong? rather than, again, just saying, hmm, I like that hairstyle. So these are just some examples to remind you of the things that might happen so that we can move into the crux of why I was asked to be here today. So if you're wondering, well, what do you, what do, you do to continually become more culturally curious instead of culturally critical? An easy way to remember this is to be basic. And it's already on your postcard, and when you download the two PDFs I have for you, one of them goes into detail with each step. But I'll do the, do the steps right now. So the first is breathe. Now, we know that meditation is a good thing. I'm not talking about that kind of breathing. 
But when we realize we just had a biased thought or when we realize we're interacting with someone we don't know or understand and we're feeling that little bit of discomfort, what we want to do is take a breath because you feed the oxygen to your prefrontal neocortex, which is the part of your brain that moderates your emotions. The anterior cingulate cortex is where the emotions jump right in because the amygdala is helping it to do that. And you need it to calm down a bit because the amygdala is trying to help you see fight, flight, or freeze when maybe you're not in danger. So if you take a breath, it helps you to modulate yourself to get to what Daniel Kahneman calls your slow brain so that you can be more analytical. You can say, hmm, when does this apply this time? So take a breath. The next is to be willing to be the other. And panelists talked about this this morning with various things that they do to learn different cultures. Now, I'm not suggesting that the only way to do that is to go to a different place of worship, if you happen to go to a place of worship. But I use this slide because 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated time during the week. So if you do happen to go to a place of worship, go somewhere else occasionally. If you're a little uncomfortable about doing that by yourself, find someone that you know that has a different, that worships a different religion than you and experience their traditions. I've even shared that comment or that suggestion with clergy and I'm stunned at how surprised they are. Even, really? I could tell my congregation to go to another church, hello? My point though is all of us are human and we're so afraid of what's different. Now, you don't have to just do that. It could be all different things. Now, you happen to work in a place that is very diverse. That's not enough to be around people during the work time. Intentionally use your own time to learn about cultures different than you. Intentionally go to those cultures around which you are most uncomfortable. Because what will happen is your biases and stereotypes will come to fore and you'll realize that that's all it was. Now, I'm not suggesting you put yourself in a dangerous situation, of course, but you'll realize that most of your fears just don't apply anymore. So be willing to be the other. Ask for feedback. Dr. Brown, I think earlier, had said that all of us in this room are leaders in one way or another. When you're the leader, don't share your ideas first. Ask the rest of your team what their ideas are. Because since you're D, a DE&I lead at one level or another, people do assume you got it, you know it all. And we know that's not true, we're always learning. So ask your team for their ideas first. If somebody comes up with an idea that is very similar to one that you had, give them the credit. You don't need it, give it to them. Be willing to ask for feedback. If you know you have a particular bias, and you'd like to get beyond it, we can't get rid of them, but we can disrupt them, then go to somebody you trust, not your partner, spouse, um, or significant other, whichever term you happen to use. Don't go to them, it's too much emotion. But go to someone else, like a best friend, and say, you know, I realize I've got a bias about weight, size, what, whatever it might be. And because so many of our biases are unconscious, I need you to point out to me if I happen to say or do something that shows that bias, just bring it to my attention. Now, don't throw me under the bus, you know, call it to my attention offline, just you and me, so that I can become more aware. Be willing to ask for feedback. Suspend judgment is the S. Remember, being biased is normal. So when you realize you're having a biased thought, just suspend it for a moment and see if you can prove yourself wrong instead of always proving yourself right. Invite others. Invite people different than you to be in your space. Now, not only at work, again, not just with your team. If you're gonna have a dinner party, invite some folks to your dinner party who you haven't invited before, who are very different than the rest of the people. Now, don't just invite one person who's different, <laughs> but invite a few. It'll change the tenor of the conversation. 
most likely it'll make, it, make the party much more interesting. So be willing to do that. This is the hardest one. Check your ego at the door. Because you see, you got to where you are today in your career because of the, the decisions you've made in the past. And those decisions obviously were good ones because they got you to where you are. We're not suggesting that you don't continue to make those good decisions. What we are ex suggesting though is to expand it. To recognize that just because you were right five years ago doesn't mean that you were right this time with this person. So we can put those things in place, but we still need one more thing. The first is to assume positive intent. Most people don't get up in the morning trying to make your life miserable. All of us are much more self-focused. So they're not busy trying to make you miserable. Now, by the way, I know there are some people who do that. I'm not talking about those folks. I'm talking about most of the people that you interact with. They're just doing things the way it makes sense to them. So take a breath and assume positive intent. Now in some cases, when somebody's doing something on a regular basis that just gets under your skin, you can just avoid them. Unfortunately, the people who do that are usually the people you can't avoid. But, it's, so here's the thing, is pick your battles. If something happens with someone you're never gonna see again, and you have a sense that they aren't going to hear you anyway, then don't waste your energy if you're never going to see them again. Now, sometimes you can just accept people the way they are. They're doing something that might get under your skin a bit, but you can accept them anyway. Let me give you an example. My favorite aunt, we call her Aunt Lou. Her actual name is Looney Pearl. Looney Pearl had four kids. She was my stepmother's sister, is my stepmother's sister, she's still alive, my, uh, Looney Pearl is. She had four kids. So when I was living with my dad and my stepmom, I loved going to her house because her kids were in my age range, so we hung out all the time together. And Looney Pearl was a great cook. My stepmother, not so much. Now. She would tell you that, okay, so I'm not saying anything out of school. But Looney Pearl was a great cook. I loved being around her. I always felt like I belonged. Well, then I went to college and then got married and then moved to University of Michigan to Ann Arbor. And so I didn't see Aunt Lou very much. I would see her one time a year. My husband and I were lucky. My family's tradition was on New Christmas Eve. His family tradition was on the day after Christmas. So we'd come to New Jersey, which is where I was from. We'd hang out with my family. I'd see Aunt Lou. Then we'd fly on Christmas Day and go visit his family in Virginia the day after. It worked out really well. So when I would see Aunt Lou, she'd always ask me this question. So Lenora, when are you going to have kids? Now, my husband and I have just celebrated our 45th anniversary, and we chose not to have children. So we call ourselves child-free, not childless, as we like everybody's kids and we can send them back. <laughs> now, I'm proud of that decision that we made because still today it was the right decision for us. But my point is this, Aunt Lou would ask that question every year. And I love Aunt Lou, so I didn't want to get into a whole philosophical debate about it. You know, she had four kids, so she didn't understand why anyone would not want to have kids. And plus, I frankly didn't think it was any of her business why we chose not to have kids. But here's the thing. I still see Aunt Lou at Christmas. She's now 95. She is not suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's. And I think she now asked me the question just because she knows she's going to get a laugh from anyone who hears her but she still will lean in and say, so Lenora, when are you gonna have kids? <laughs> and what I say to her is, Aunt Lou, we're working on it. <laughs> and then we can move on. So there are some people, depending on the relationship you have with them, that you can just accept them. But then there are other folks that, mm -mm, I have to take action on this because see, I'm taking home that stress every time they say something or do something. 
I, I need to figure out a way to help them know how important this is to me. And that's where the stop technique comes in. And the handout that you have on the table are the four steps. It's a blank worksheet, but, I'm, but here's the thing with the stop technique. It is simple, but not easy. Simple, but not easy. So I give you that worksheet so you at least have one hard copy of it, but you'll get other worksheets with some examples as well when you download um, from the website. So here's the steps. The first step is simply state. The second step is tell. The third is options. And the fourth is positive results. So let's walk through them one at a time. State the behavior. Now, typically, when we give people feedback, we're in the midst of being emotional. We do it right after they did something. And we're busy telling them what we don't want them to do. And we're telling them what they're thinking, which goes totally in the wrong direction. Right? So we want to start with what is the behavior? You should be able to see it, smell it, taste it, touch it, count it. Some kind of way, some behavior, so that when you state this behavior to the other person, they know exactly what you're talking about. If you don't get the behavior clear, the rest of this technique falls apart. Now, by the way, this is not a technique to use when someone is breaking company policy when someone is breaking the law. This is not for that. This is to use with your colleagues and your coworkers when you need to give them feedback in a way they can hear it. Now, if you've taken any feedback sessions, and I bet you probably have, most feedback workshops will say, don't start with you, start with I. This switches it, and it's intentional. So you start with the behavior so they know exactly what you're talking about. So let's practice a little bit. Which of the following is a clear behavior? I'll give you a chance to read it, and you just shout out which one you think is best. Yeah. Number one is the best, because the whole stop technique, when you get really good at it, is only going to take you about 45 seconds. It's not a dialogue. This is direct feedback you're giving to someone. So the behavior part is just the beginning of the sentence. Stan, when you give me a high five to show me approval, so Stan will remember, okay, she, she's talking something about a high five. That's the behavior. That's all that it is. It's that simple. The next is tell the person how you feel. Now, sometimes people get hung up on this one because they want to tell the person their opinion. Another word for opinion is judgment. And the minute you start sharing your opinion or your judgment, that causes the listener to become defensive. They're not going to hear anything else. Additionally, because most human beings do not want to hurt your feelings, remember the first question I started with, most human beings don't want to hurt your feelings. So if you share with them how you feel, they're immediately now leaning into what else you're going to say because they didn't mean to hurt your feelings in the first place. Now, I know that's not everybody. There are some people that couldn't care less what you thought. We're not talking about those folks. We're talking about the people that really do care, that really do want to interact effectively. So read these three, and I'm going to give you 45 seconds to work at your table, talk to your teammates on which one you think is the clearest example. You can talk now. <laughs> And it could be, I should say, what's a way to rephrase it? I didn't say a clearest example was the earlier one. This one, you want to rephrase it. How could you rephrase that so people would actually hear it? So they all have something in common. This is the feeling stage, but all three of them start with you. And I started hearing your answers already. Whatever the statement is here, it needs to start with I feel. 
because we don't know what's in that person's head, right? And we need to own our own feelings. Now that's a whole nother workshop <laughs> because you could choose not to be upset about certain things. But if it's really important, and that's when you use this technique, when it's something that's really important, then you need to own that feeling because you're about to ask someone to change their behavior when you're the one with the challenge. They don't even know that there's any issue. So you, the first one is you. It's going to start with when you do whatever it is. The second, the feeling, starts with I feel, and then you tell them how you feel. Now, some people have a tough time getting in, in touch with their feelings. Luckily, we have the Google machine. So Google the word feelings, positive or negative, and you'll come up with a ton of them. And find a word that's going to fit for you when you're using this activity. I mean, using this technique. The next is options. In other words, what's, what should they be doing if they stop doing what you ask them to? So what do you put in place of it? Again, this is where our feedback usually falls down. Because we tell people what we don't like, but we don't give them a replacement. We don't tell them what we'd like for them to do instead. So we need to give them some examples. So if this is what was happening, this might be a, a, an inequity, which phrase would be the better one to use? Right, I would prefer, because you really ought to, <laughs> that, that's being judgmental. And not we think you should. This is a one-on-one -on -one dialogue, I mean one-on-one -on -one, um, interchange here. Even if you know three or four people in the department feel the same way you do, you're not speaking for all of them at this moment, especially if this is the first time this offender heard about the particular things they're doing. So it's just between you and me. And obviously you want to have these conversations in a private place. The last is positive results. In other words, what's in it for them to change their behavior? In training, you know the term with them, what's in it for me? That's what they're going to be thinking. What's in it for me to change my behavior? You want to answer that question. And I don't have an example for this one because it's totally dependent upon what the situation is. It could be that you'll be able to, you and that person will be able to get to the task quicker because you'll really be listening to everything they're saying, not waiting for this thing that they do or say that upsets you. Maybe you already have a great relationship and you want to make it even better. But the point is you want to find something that's in it for them as well as for you so that they would be willing to make this change. Then when you go through all four of those steps, you want to end with, are you willing to work with me on this? Are you willing to help me with this? So that you're saying to that person, I own this problem. I need your help. Because remember, your feelings are your problem, not theirs. So you want to ask them for help. Now, if at the end of this and they say, mm-mm, then you know you have a bigger problem than what you initially thought. But that's not what most people do. They don't just write out say no. And then there's several what ifs. So first of all, unlike much of the feedback, uh, many of the feedback techniques that we've learned in the past that say immediate feedback is critical. This one is one you need to sit. Let it sit for a little while. Because when a person does whatever those things are, your emotions have come to the forefront. And you have to waddle in it a little bit. If you're angry, you have to let yourself be angry a little bit, but not in front of that person. Because if you're still angry, you're not ready to talk to them yet. You have to wait until you're going to be calm enough, which is why I give you the worksheets. Because for this to work really well, you need to be able to reduce what you're going to say to that person to words on a piece of paper. If you can't write it clearly, not that you have to memorize it, but if you can't write it clearly enough for somebody else to understand, even if they don't know the person, you're not ready to talk to that individual yet.
And so give yourself some time. Now, don't wait six months, you know, so if somebody does something today, then it might be next week or it might be three days. It just depends on how long it's going to take you to work yourself through the steps. But there are some what ifs. So if the offender interrupts you, so you just finish saying when you and you identify the behavior and they immediately interrupt you, you let them interrupt you. You respectfully give them eye contact or whatever is necessary to keep that relationship. And when they finish, then you say, I hear you, and you go right back to where you were. It's called the broken record. You probably know that. You go right back to wherever you left off. So unlike when you see some of the talking heads on TV where they're yelling on top of each other all the time, that's, that's not going to work because nobody can hear anything. So just let them say what they're going to say because really that's going to give you more information. And then you go right back to where you were because that says to the person, you know, this is really important to her because she's not letting me off the hook. The next is they deny everything you're saying. They say they don't even think they ever did this. That's a signal to you that step number one, behavior, was not clear enough. And in that case, you might say to them, you know, Paul, this is so important to me. I really want to get it right. When's an another time that would be a good time to talk to you? Again, that says to them, you're not letting them off the hook, but you know you need to go back and practice a little bit more to be more clear and specific. Now, if the person does five or six things that get on your nerves, don't try to cover all five or six <laughs> in one conversation. Just pick one thing. If they seem like they're ignoring you, they're looking at their watch or their phone or any other thing that's one of those ouches that says you're not important enough, then you probably need to say to them, I can tell you're really busy right now. This is not a good time. Tell me when a good time is. Let's pull out our calendars and find that time. So yet again, you're not letting them off the hook. Now, sometimes people hear better when they're not looking at you. So, you know, they may need to look away and they're processing what you're saying to them. So don't immediately assume that they're ignoring you. Oftentimes when people will say, oh, oh, I didn't mean any harm. I, just get over it. You know, I was just joking. That will oftentimes come up. You can say something like, Sam, I understand your intentions were good. It didn't land quite the right way for me or something along those lines. So you acknowledge that their intentions were good and then you go back to where you were. This is still important to me. Now, don't say but. Just put a period there and say it's still important. So the challenge is we only have a short time together. Where normally what I just shared with you, I take at least two hours, usually three. So you have lots of um, practice. What I encourage you to do is to find an accountability partner, someone else hopefully in this room, who's also heard the same thing, and you practice this with them before you use it. I promise you, it really works. I get stories all the time of people using this technique, both at work as well as outside work. It's amazing. It works particularly well with kids, so practice it first with kids that don't impact your salary. <laughs> It works really well with kids because you're telling them essentially why you need them to change. So there was Annie. Now remember, it was March of 1994. I had not made a commitment to this field of work, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Although when I started my business in 1986, by 1988, many of my colleagues were saying, well, Lenore, you should do diversity work. Now, for those of you who, who know the history of diversity and how it became the uh, word the way we use it now, it really kind of started with Workforce 2000, 
when that government report said that by the year 2000, the majority of people entering the workplace would be other than white males. And so corporations were saying, uh-oh, we need to figure out a way to attract the best talent. We probably need to do some things differently. So my colleagues were saying, well, Lenore, you should do this work. And I would say, why? And they said, well, you're black and female. That was not a good enough reason. Because I did start paying attention to what other people were doing, and at that time, people doing work in this field, at least those that I saw, were judgmental. They made their audience members feel guilty. Now, not all of them, but many of them. And what happens when we know this information, all of us collectively in this room, sometimes we get a little righteous. We have to be careful of that. But that's what I was seeing, and I thought, that is so not my style. So I need to figure out something else. So I was in South Africa with this leadership development program. And I had been delivering leadership development and customer service and just all kinds of things, trying to figure out what I should do, because my colleagues who had been in the business a long time said, you've got to pick a lane in some way. You either need to pick a topic or you need to pick an industry. And although I loved automotive, that was not the industry I saw myself being in for my full career. So while I was there in March of 1994, in the back of my head, I was still searching for what my area of focus should be. So there I was. It was a full day leadership development program. Now, in a full day leadership development program, you know how you have people walking around in blindfolds and doing all kinds of other things so that they can get a sense of, of what it's like to be led and all kinds of other things like that. So we had a great time. And at the end of the day, several people came up to talk to me. And I was chit chatting with them, and I noticed that Annie was still sitting in exactly the same place. I remembered that she did not participate at all unless she had to. So that was a clue to me that she probably wanted to talk to me alone. After all 60 of the other folks had left, she finally started to get up. And as she got up, I saw she was heaving. She was crying. She was crying so hard that the tears were falling off her face to the floor as she's walking toward me. Now, my immediate thought was, was I that bad? Because <laughs> I was still too self-focused, quite frankly. So I started walking toward her just so that she wouldn't have to struggle so hard. When I got to her, she gave me a bear hug. Now, I'm a hugger, but you know when you hug somebody and you're ready to let go and they're not? <laughs> it was one of those kind of hugs. And as she was hugging me, I could feel her tears on my face. So when she finally let me go, it was when she thought she could talk at least a little bit through her tears. So what I'm about to tell you, she was crying through the whole thing. But what she said to me was, I'm an Afrikaner. Do you know what that is? Afrikaners were the people in power that implemented apartheid for over 40 years. So I'd been to South Africa many times and had studied it before then. And I said, yes, I know. She said, when I walked in this room and I saw that you, a black woman from America, was our presenter, every bone in my body, every ounce of my being wanted to turn around and leave. And she cried some more. She said, I couldn't leave because my bosses were here. So I was determined to not do anything but sit in the back. But then she said, I know the real reason 
why I was supposed to be here. You see, as we speak, my husband, my brothers, and my sons are gathering guns and ammunition to be prepared to kill every black person they see. And I realize now that I was supposed to be here to experience you as 100% human. And my job is to go home and convince my husband, my brothers, and my sons to lay down their arms. So we cried together. We talked a bit more. This was 1994. There was no internet. There was no email. There was no way for me to find out whatever happened to Annie. But at that time, way back then, there was pretty much only one way to get to South Africa, and it was a 17-hour flight. I had a lot of time to think the next day. And what I realized was diversity, equity, and inclusion is not just about how much knowledge you have. It's not even just about the words you use. It's also about showing up and being 100% authentically who you are and creating a space for other people to be authentically who they are. I shared last night at dinner with several folks that there's two groups of people that I most love to do this work with. One group is educators, because I believe teachers are the brain surgeons of our kids. And what they say off the cuff can change a child's life, for good or for bad. And it's usually those things they say off the cuff, not the stuff that's in a lesson plan, that impacts children the most. And the other one is healthcare professionals. Because your decisions literally cause people to live or die. So the more you can understand people different than you and help them see who you authentically are, the more University of Michigan School of Medicine will continue not only to be the best, but to produce the best that can change the world. Ubuntu, thank you so much for allowing me to be with you. You know, uh, thank you very much for all the wisdom that you shared with us today. We've uh, had many years of people coming and sharing, and it's always great to know that there are new things that we can learn and new ways that we can think about the work that we do. So we really appreciate what you've done for us today. And we have not one, but two. Since you're a Michigan alum, you get two gifts from us. So we hope that you enjoy this. So thank, thank you so very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. And so with that, uh, we'll also give all of us the gift of lunch, which I believe is over there to the left. Are you guys ready for us to come? They need three minutes. So uh, you can freshen up, and then in three minutes you can have lunch, and then we'll continue our program after that. Thank you.
It's a pleasure. I haven't Good seen you in a long time. How are you doing? Good. My name is Lee. Chase. Nice it's nice to meet, to meet you. you here. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, too. Yes. <laughs> a really strong barrier for me was that there was not a lot of my nationality at U of L. And I was really nervous because I felt, okay, what are people going to say about me? What are people going to think about me? One of the reasons that I wanted to come to U of M was for the diversity. However, when I got here, I hung out with the same people that I went to high school with. I found that people from other countries hung out with their friends, and I just didn't really feel that like experience that I thought I was gonna get. When me and the, uh, the patient get to know each other, and I always trying to say, regardless where I came, came from, you know, and what language I speak, doesn't really um, change the way I want to try to provide the best care for you. And I, I don't have trying to say many things to prove that. I come from Taiwan. It's part of Chinese culture that I, uh, that's my heritage. That kind of language barrier and the cultural difference really challenged me at first. Being a male nurse has been, um, I, I'd say, it's been not a horrible path, but it's definitely had its trying times. They're like, oh, nurse, why don't you just become a doctor? You know? And it's like, well, no, that's not what I want to do. That's not who I am. I don't want to become a doctor. And they don't understand. They think doctor is male role. They think nursing is female role. And that's a very dated, antiquated thought process. And I always hated that. In the three decades that I've been here, mm -hmm. I see much more diversity within the health system. Mm -hmm. Even though I think we're diverse, mm -hmm. there might be some individuals that don't think we're diverse enough. Right. Right. Yeah. But I feel that the university or the Michigan Medicine is mm -hmm. trying. What can be done differently to have a more diverse group of people? I, I joined the recruitment and retention committee and um, I go to the job fairs. So I can see what's out there, can maybe help try to, you know, recruit people. U of M has become like a melting pot now. Uh, and I look at that and I smile because now when everyone come in, they see me, they see Darius. They see the uniqueness of the University of Michigan nursing. And so I have something unique and special that can that I can actually bring to the table. It's very heartwarming to know that that we are working in this environment that, that people are very open-minded and it's easy to blend in with, with all kind of cultural background. After 10 years, I'm very confident, but still getting patients from time to time, you know, like that, but I still feel like I can change them. Yeah. And that that's the Michigan difference. Hey, I'm Marissa. Hi, I'm Brooke. It's nice, nice to meet you. you. Nice to meet nice you. To meet you too. Yes. <laughs> Michelle. Corey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How are it's you? a pleasure. I haven't seen you in a long time. How are you doing? Hi. Hi, I'm Natalie. Natalie Courtney. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> We have some nurses who have been there for 20, 30 years, and they have so much knowledge to share. But I have noticed at times when there's a new policy or we get some new technology, those tend to be the people that fight the the change. So it's intimidating for us to be to come into the new profession, but I think it's really intimidating for older nurses to go into all of this new technology and computer stuff because they're not used to it and they didn't get into their nursing habits that way. I was always afraid, oh, when we get older, will we be pushed out by the technology, the new things? And thankfully, we always have the new, new recruit, new generation, new blood coming to the office, work with us. And I'm, I'm happy to see that new generation. That has been where I have found connections with the older nurses because they all want to help patients just as much as we do. They have that passion, they have that experience. Back in the 80s, associate degree programs were more popular. You know, they were really trying to promote entry level as a bachelor's mm -hmm. on it. And so I did see some um, tension sometimes right. working alongside nurses. Are you an associate degree? Are you a bachelor's degree? Um, with that and a lot of discussion on should it be the same pay and mm -hmm. and you know we we all take the same state boards yeah. but we have different degrees behind mm -hmm. it when I hired in they're like how did you get a job here you're not a you're not a U of M alum same thing too. Me? well Hi. what does that have to do with anything you know I passed the same tests as, as the next person who was tough 
we thought <laughs> that the um, more experienced older nurses were a little mean. Some personalities just don't mesh well, and I've, I've encouraged those people, you'll get through this, take from this experience, like you do from the ones that you like, you know? There's something to be learned from every experience. When you're in a profession that you're constantly helping others, I think sometimes it's helpful when we can say to each other, I really enjoyed how you did that, or I learned a lot from the way you handled that situation. And the more I can build them up, they tend to be more willing also to come to me and say, you know, maybe I can teach you something here. Now, I, I'm amazed at how supportive we are of new nurses entering the field. And we're seeing a lot more of a mix. We're seeing people that are coming in that, like I said, are traditional and yeah. see what mm -hmm. we call second career. Yeah. And I think we need to value each other on what we offer to the profession as a whole. No matter where you, the background is, where you come from, if you had a first career somewhere else or you did a traditional four-year college right out of high school. Like, no matter what your background is, you, you'll fit in here. It's nice to see our workforce in a mixture of old people, experienced, but we also have young people with the energy, the, the skill in technology to help things going. And uh, I think that kind of mixture is very healthy for our working environment. Support one another, because you're going to have a rough day. You can't make it without good teamwork. That's just the bottom line. Hey, I'm Marissa. Hi, I'm Brooke. It's, it's nice, nice to meet you. you. My name is Lee. Chase. It's nice, nice to, to meet you. you here. Hi, David. Hi, Tiffany. Good seeing mm, you. You too. Hi, I'm Dia. Hi, Andrew. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you also. How are Hi, you? it's a pleasure. I haven't Good seen you in a long time. Hi. Hi, I'm Natalie. Natalie Courtney. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> when you're a new grad, you have this vulnerability to you where you are trying to like be a sponge and kind of just learn everything that you can but it's a very nerve-wracking time I think just naturally and in general you're trying to figure out who you are as a nurse and as a young adult. We always heard that the nurses kill their young. <laughs> a lot of us when we were graduating from school we was kind of fearful about coming to, to that environment because we didn't want to feel like rejected we didn't want to feel like we didn't know I think the biggest barrier for me would just be myself I think as a new nurse you just you don't trust your judgment sometimes when you have patients yelling at you and you're trying to explain it you're like I'm really just trying to help and, it, and sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's they can't help the situation, so they're mad. Sometimes it's just, they're not nice. <laughs> there were so many times where I went home and I was like, I don't know if I can cut this, like this is not for me. It was like nearing the end of my orientation when I was just about to be on my own. I still felt that way. My very first day on my own, everything went smoothly. Then day two went smoothly. Day three, there were some hiccups, but it still went smoothly and I handled them. And it just kept rolling on top of each other like that. And that's when I knew, I'm like, okay, I can do this. I remember celebrating after my first year in the SICU going, oh, I didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> you know? right. I did okay, like I'm gonna make it, you know? Um, I had one nurse who I think had a really hard time with us um, transitioning over into the nursing role, those of us who were techs or nursing students on the floor. And I always kind of found like I had to prove myself to her. And I remember she just came up to me once and she's like, I'm feeling a little lost about this. Can you just walk me through what this is about? And I'm like, Sh sure. Like, and I, so I was a little confused at the time, but it was a really nice moment for me because I felt like, okay, she trusts me. Maybe I've proved myself at this point in time. And so that was a really powerful moment for me. I, I'm amazed at how supportive we are of new nurses entering the field. And I think we need to value each other on what we offer to the profession as a whole. You know more than you think you know. Trust your education, you know, trust yourself, be nice to yourself. Even though it was terrifying going from a small place to such a large university, it was comforting to know that I wasn't alone and there's all kinds of support available. When I actually started on my unit, it definitely was the experiences that made me into the nurse I am today and it took the difficult times and the challenging patients to make the most progress. This job is hard and unthankful but it really isn't just like you said it's it's how what your perspective is you're honored and that's an excellent word you're honored to be part of that for these 
families. Just be the best that you can be, that you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I'm doing something really good for people. I guess I would just tell myself, just do it. Get to it quick. Push through those tough times because you're going to love it. It's going to be awesome. How are you? It's a pleasure. I haven't seen you in a long time. How are you doing? Good. My name is Lee. Chase. It's nice, nice to meet you, you here. Hi, how Hi. are you? Nice to meet you. Yes. <laughs> a really strong barrier for me was that there was not a lot of my nationality at U of M. And I was really nervous because I felt, okay, what are people going to say about me? What are people going to think about me? One of the reasons that I wanted to come to U of M was for the diversity. However, when I got here, I hung out with the same people that I went to high school with. I found that people from other countries hung out with their friends, and I just didn't really feel that, like, experience that I thought I was going to get. When me and uh, the patient get to know each other, and I always trying to say, regardless where I came from, you know, and what language I speak, doesn't really um, change the way I want to try to provide the best care for you. And I, I don't have trying to say many things to prove that. I come from Taiwan. It's part of Chinese culture that I, uh, that's my heritage. That kind of language barrier and the cultural difference really challenged me at first. Being a male nurse has been, um, I, I'd say, it's been not a horrible path, but it's definitely had its trying times. They're like, oh, nurse wants you to become doctor, you know? And it's like, well, no, that's not what I want to do. That's not who I am. I don't want to become a doctor. And they don't understand. They think doctor is male role. They think nursing is female role. And that's a very dated, antiquated thought process. And I always hated that. In the three decades that I've been here, mm -hmm. I see much more diversity within the health system. Mm -hmm. Even though I think we're diverse, mm -hmm. there might be some individuals that don't think we're diverse enough. Right. Right. Yeah. But I feel that the university or the Michigan Medicine is mm -hmm. trying. What can be done differently to have a more diverse group of people. I, I joined the recruitment and retention committee and um, I go to the job fairs. So I can see what's out there, can maybe help try to, you know, recruit people. U of M has become like a melting pot now. Uh, and I look at that and I smile because now when everyone come in, they see me, they see Darius they see the uniqueness of the University of Michigan nursing. And so I have something unique and special that can that I can actually bring to the table. It's very heartwarming to know that that we are working in this environment that, that people are very open-minded and it's easy to blend in with, with all kind of cultural background. After 10 years, I'm very confident, but still getting patients from time to time, you know, like that, but I still feel like I can change them. Yeah. And that that's the Michigan difference. Hey, I'm Marissa. Hi, I'm Brooke. It's nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Nice to meet nice you. To meet you yes. <laughs> Michelle. Corey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How are you? It's a pleasure. I haven't seen you in a long time. How are you doing? Hi. Hi, I'm Natalie. Natalie Courtney. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> We have some nurses who have been there for 20, 30 years, and they have so much knowledge to share. But I have noticed at times when there's a new policy or we get some new technology, those tend to be the people that fight the the change. So it's intimidating for us to be to come into the new profession, but I think it's really intimidating for older nurses to go into all of this new technology and computer stuff because they're not used to it and they didn't get into their nursing habits that way. I was always afraid, oh, when we get older, will we be pushed out by the technology, the new things? And thankfully, we always have the new, new recruit, new generation, newer blood coming to the office and work with us. And I'm, I'm happy to see that newer generation. That has been where 
I have found connections with the older nurses because they all want to help patients just as much as we do. They have that passion, they have that experience. Back in the 80s, associate degree programs were more popular. You know, they were really trying to promote entry level as a bachelor's on it. And so I did see some um, tension sometimes working alongside nurses. Are you an associate degree? Are you a bachelor's degree? Um, with that and a lot of discussion on should it be the same pay and and you know we, we all take the same state boards yeah. but we have different degrees behind it when I hired in they're like how did you get a job here you're not a you're not a U of M alum the same thing too. Me? well Why? what does that have to do with anything you know I passed the same tests as, as the next person it was tough we thought that the um, more experienced older nurses were a little mean. Some personalities just don't mesh well, and I've, I've encouraged those people, you'll get through this, take from this experience, like you do from the ones that you like, you know? There's something to be learned from every experience. When you're in a profession that you're constantly helping others, I think sometimes it's helpful when we can say to each other, I really enjoyed how you did that, or I learned a lot from the way you handled that situation. And the more I can build them up, they tend to be more willing also to come to me and say, you know, maybe I can teach you something here. Now, I, I'm amazed at how supportive we are of new nurses entering the field. And we're seeing a lot more of a mix. We're seeing people that are coming in that, like I said, are traditional and yes. see what mm -hmm. we call second career. Yes. And I think we need to value each other on what we offer to the profession as a whole. No matter where you, the background uh, is, where you come from, if you had a first career somewhere else or you did a traditional four-year college right out of high school, like no matter what your background is, you, you'll fit in here. It's nice to see our workforce in a mixture of old people, experienced, but we also have young people with the energy, the, the skill in technology to help things going and uh, I think that kind of mixture is very healthy for our working environment. Support one another because you're gonna have a rough day. You can't make it without good teamwork. That's just the bottom line. Hey, I'm Marissa. Hi, I'm Brooke. It's, it's nice, nice to meet, meet you. you. My name is Lee. Chase. It's nice, nice to, meet to meet you here. Hi, David. Hi, Tiffany. Good seeing you. Mm, you too. Hi, I'm Dia. Hi, Andrew. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you also. How are Hi, you? It's a pleasure. I haven't Good seen you in a you. long time. Hi. Hi, I'm Natalie. Natalie Courtney. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> when you're a new grad, you have this vulnerability to you where you are trying to like be a sponge and kind of just learn everything that you can, but it's a very nerve-wracking time, I think, just naturally. And in general, you're trying to figure out who you are as a nurse and as a young adult. We always heard that the nurses kill their young. <laughs> a lot of us, when we were graduating from school, we was kind of fearful about coming to, to that environment because we didn't want to feel like rejected. We didn't want to feel like we didn't know. I think the biggest barrier for me would just be myself. I think as a new nurse, you just, you don't trust your judgment sometimes. When you have patients yelling at you, and you're trying to explain it, you're like, I'm really just trying to help. Right. And, it, and sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's they can't help the situation, so they're mad. Right. Sometimes it's just, they're not nice. <laughs> there were so many times where I went home, and I was like, I don't know if I can cut this, like, this is not for me. It was like nearing the end of my orientation, when I was just about to be on my own. I still felt that way, my very first day on my own. Everything went smoothly. Then day two went smoothly. Day three, there were some hiccups, but still went smoothly and I handled them. And it just kept rolling on top of each other like that. And that's when I knew I'm like, okay, I can do this. I remember celebrating after my first year in the sick queue going, oh, I didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> you know? right. I did okay. Like, I'm going to make it, you know? Um, I had one nurse who I think had a really hard time with us. Um, transitioning over into the nursing role, those of us who were techs or nursing students on the floor. And I always kind of found like I had to prove myself to her. And I remember she just came up to me once and she's like, I'm feeling a little lost about this. Can you just walk me through what this is about? And I'm like, Sh sure. Like, <laughs> and I, so I was a little confused at the time, but it was a really nice moment for me because I felt like, okay, she trusts me. Maybe I've proved myself at this point in time. And so that was a really powerful moment for me. I, I'm amazed at how supportive we are of new nurses entering the field. And I think we need to value each other on what we offer to the profession as a whole.
You know more than you think you know. Trust your education, you know, trust yourself, be nice to yourself. Even though it was terrifying going from a small place to such a large university, it was comforting to know that I wasn't alone and there's all kinds of support available. When I actually started on my unit, it definitely was the experiences that made me into the nurse I am today. And it took the difficult times and the challenging patients to make the most progress. This job is hard and unthankful, but it really isn't just like you said, it's, it's how what your perspective is. You're honored and that's an excellent word. You're honored to be part of that for these families. Just be the best that you can be, that you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I'm doing something really good for people. I guess I would just tell myself, just do it. Get to it quick. Push through those tough times because you're going to love it. It's going to be awesome. How are you? It's a pleasure. I haven't seen you in a long time. How are you doing? Good. My name is Lee. Chase. It's nice, nice to, to meet you. you here. Hi. How Hi. are you? Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Yes. <laughs> a really strong barrier for me was that there was not a lot of my nationality at U of L. And I was really nervous because I felt, okay, what are people going to say about me? What are people going to think about me? One of the reasons that I wanted to come to U of M was for the diversity. However, when I got here, I hung out with the same people that I went to high school with. I found that people from other countries hung out with their friends, and I just didn't really feel that like experience that I thought I was gonna get. When me and uh, the patient get to know each other and I always trying to say regardless where I came, came from you know and what language I speak doesn't really um, change the way I want to try to provide the best care for you and I, I don't have trying to say many things to prove that. I come from Taiwan it's part of Chinese culture that I uh, that's my heritage that kind of language barrier and the cultural difference really challenged me at first. Being a male nurse has been um, I, I'd say it's been not a horrible path, but it's definitely had its trying times. They're like, oh, nurse wants you to become a doctor, you know? And that's like, well, no, that's not what I want to do. That's not who I am. I don't want to become a doctor. And they don't understand. They think doctor is male role. They think nursing is female role. And that's a very dated, antiquated thought process. And I always hated that. In the three decades that I've been here, mm -hmm. I see much more diversity within the health system. Mm -hmm. Even though I think we're diverse, mm -hmm. there might be some individuals that don't think we're diverse enough. Right, right, yeah. But I feel that the university or that Michigan Medicine is mm -hmm. trying. What can be done differently to have a more diverse group of people? I, I joined the recruitment and retention re committee and um, I go to the job fairs. So I can see what's out there, can maybe help try to, you know, recruit people. U of M has become like a melting pot now. Uh, and I look at that and I smile because now when everyone come in, they see me, they see Darice, they see the uniqueness of the University of Michigan nursing. And so I have something unique and special that can that I can actually bring to the table. It's very heartwarming to know that that we are working in this environment, that, that people are very open-minded and it's easy to blend in with, with all kind of cultural background. After 10 years, I'm very confident, but still getting patients from time to time, you know, like that, but I still feel like I can change them. Yeah. And that that's the Michigan difference. Hey, I'm Marissa. Hi, I'm Brooke. It's nice, nice to meet you. you. Nice to meet nice you. To meet you too. Yes. <laughs> Michelle. Corey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How are it's you? a pleasure. I haven't seen you in a long time. How are you doing? Hi. Hi, I'm Natalie. Natalie Courtney. Nice, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> We have some nurses who have been there for 20, 30 years, and they have so much knowledge to share. But I have noticed at times when there's a new policy or we get some new technology, those tend to be the people that fight the the change. So it's intimidating for us to, be co to come into the new profession, but I think it's really intimidating for older nurses to go into all of this new technology and computer stuff because they're not used to it and they didn't get into their nursing habits that way. I was always afraid, oh, when we get older, will we be pushed out by the 
technology, the new things, and thankfully, we always have the new, new recruit, new generation, newer blood coming to the office, work with us.
Yeah. Yeah. All right, I hope everyone has enjoyed their lunch. We're gonna come back uh, now for our fireside chat with Lenora. Uh, we're gonna introduce ourselves first and then we're gonna go ahead and get started. I do wanna note though, um, I know some people had to leave directly following lunch, so feel free to scoot down or come forward. Uh, we're happy for you too, um, and we look forward to talking with you. So I'm Clarissa Love. I am a DEI consultant in the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. Uh, I'm so excited uh, to talk with Lenora a little bit longer than the keynote uh, that we had earlier to hear a little more of her thoughts about things. Uh, and Lenora is, Billings Harris was here and she gave, delivered our keynote for those that may that be just joining us this afternoon. So Lenora, I really, your keynote really resonated with me. There were some key things that came out of it that I really thought were just so practical. And one of the biggest things that we struggle with in our organization is time. You, you might have heard that earlier in the yes. leadership panel. And so I thought it was so interesting that you mentioned that the stop technique could be done in about 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. To be able to get down to that 45 second time, how much practice do you need to be able to put in? <laughs> right. Right. You do need to practice. However, what the main thing is to remember that the stop technique is not intended to be a dialogue. Where people get stuck is when they say, I feel, and then they share their feeling. Your tendency is to tell the person why you feel that way. No, don't do that. You might do it later, way after they've already said they're, they're gonna work with you on it. But at that moment, you wanna focus on them and you're trying to change their behavior. So why you feel as you feel is not relevant. So if you just say, I feel, and you say that, and then you go to the next step, it's kind of one long run on sentence or, or kind of two sentences you want to get the whole thing out. So if you practice by writing it out first, even if you don't memorize every word, you want to remember the key thing. Start with you, then I feel, then what the options are, um, and um, what the positive outcome is for them. Then I really encourage you to practice it with someone who, who is not the actual offender. You know, practice <laughs> it with somebody else so that you get a sense of what it feels like. It, the, the technique is so simple that people think, oh, I can just do this when I need to give feedback the next time. It really doesn't work that way. Um, so to answer your question specifically, you know, for any particular instance, after you write it down and you get that part clear, practicing it once or twice, then you should be able to do it in 45 seconds. Oh, thank you. That that makes sense. And I, I think, you know, practice, we always, you know, I think oftentimes in life we tell others to practice, <laughs> but uh, we want the quick and dirty and not to be able to practice, but I think it really does help entering into those conversations in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is, well, as your keynote was ending, uh, you said Ubuntu, and I was curious, what does Ubuntu mean? Yes. And could you tell us a little bit more? Sure. So um, I started going to South Africa in 1991. I usually would go for about three weeks at a time and twice a year. And over the weekends, instead of going, if you've ever been to South Africa, people want to go to Sun City. It's like Las Vegas. And so I kept telling the people that were bringing me there, I, why do I want to go to Sun City? And of course, my question always was, do black people who live in South Africa, are black people allowed to go in if they're not working there? And the answer was usually, well, not exactly. So that was not a place I'd go. And so I told the people who were bringing me to South Africa that I really wanted to be enmeshed in the culture. And just things would happen. I mean, miraculous things would happen all the time. And on one of those trips, I learned the, the proverb, Ubuntu. It's a Zulu proverb, and it means, I am because we are. We are because I am. And I thought, that's what diversity and inclusion is. That's another way of looking at diversity and inclusion. Ultimately, it's about all of us recognizing that we need each other. And so my company name is Ubuntu Global, so ubuntuglobal.com. Okay, thank you so much. 
And uh, we do, because this is a fireside chat and I'm not the only one that wants to chat with Lenora or might have questions, we are gonna take some questions from the audience for Lenora. And so if you have a question, um, please raise your hand and there's a couple of microphones that, that will be floating. And I think they may still be up here, so yeah. we need to get them out. Um, and I believe Mike has one in the back as well. They're both up here. here. Okay, I'm wrong. Um, and so if you would like, if you have a question, feel free to throw it out. Um, specifically around this work around leading and leadership, um, I think the work around diversity, equity, inclusion, we know that culture is so much attributed to leaders. Mm -hmm. And so from your perspective and all the work that you've done over the last 30 years, what are, what is a couple of takeaways that you would want leaders to really um, think about as they try to lead our organization forward? So the people that look to you as their leader, they think you got this just because you're a leader. They think, okay, you, you know the right answers. You know that you don't. And so one of the things that I encourage leaders to do is to show their vulnerability. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, tell your deepest, darkest secrets, but be <laughs> willing to share with the people around you that you don't know stuff and ask. So ask for their input and their wisdom. Oftentimes when I'm speaking at a conference, if the CEO is also going to be presenting, um, I will go to that person, usually a male, but not always, but I will go to that person and ask, and usually they would be kicking the conference off. Yeah. And so I'd say, and so tell me a little bit about what you're gonna share with, um, you know, with the folks in the audience, all of whom are employees. And usually they would say, I'm gonna tell them the numbers, all the metrics around DNI. And what I invite them to do is yes, share the metrics, but what they wanna know is why you think this is important. And to say you think it's important because our people are our best asset, or to say it's important because diversity is the right thing to do is too superficial. You need to tell your story. When did the light bulb go on for you? So an example is at uh, one conference, it was a celebration of the women leadership, and it was uh, with the 500 top women in this very large organization. And to have the CEO come talk to them was a really big deal. So I did have a chance to chat with him ahead of time, and he did have all his slides with all the, all the metrics around um, DNI. but then he did tell a story. So after he did all the numbers, he said, now the real reason that this is important to me, and he went on to tell his story, and in his case, he had two daughters. And he started realizing that he did not want his daughters to experience the inequities that he saw in his company already. I mean, they were pretty proud of these 500 women uh, that were the top women in the organization, but there was still a lot of work to be done. And so he was able to connect with them, and this was on the first day of a three-day conference. When I circled back to my um, contacts well after it was over, they said they talked, they said they loved what you shared, me, meaning what I shared. They said, but we were always talking about what the CEO shared, about his story. That's what will stick with them. So as a leader, be willing to share your story, because we're human beings, we're about stories. That's how people will connect. Thanks, yes, and our, our boss, Dr. Brown, he always talks about what is the story? Uh, what is the meaning behind it? And so stories are, you know, they resonate and people remember them. Like the story you shared today, I will, that story will stick in my uh, brain about how, how, you know, sometimes we have these quick judgments and afterwards we could after we have a conversation our our judgments are so far from what we would even imagine that person was thinking in the back of that room exactly. in south africa so thank you any questions from the audience now
Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I, um, I really appreciated that um, little exercise you did where you have everybody kind of shake hands and then one of it um, to, to kind of show like sometimes what you think is a lack of professionalism can be a cultural difference. And um, if it's okay with you, I just wanted to share a short story. Um, you know, I had gone to a leadership scholarship um, interview and I had shown up, you know, I thought I dressed professionally. And um, about a month later, I found out, I, I got the scholarship, but then I found out that I nearly didn't get the scholarship because something I wore um, wasn't deemed professional enough. Mm -hmm. And it was obviously not my intention not to show up professionally. I thought I dressed up great. And I was like, I look great, I'm gonna get this. Um, but sometimes if you see somebody and um, you think, oh, they didn't, you know, your first impression of the person, you're like, ah, they didn't do this, this, this. But to just be really conscious that what you think is professional can sometimes be very um, engrossed in the culture you grew up in. And sometimes someone else, like myself, who's trying to be professional, we might still miss it, even though we're trying. So I just want to share that. Thank you for sharing that, because so often um, we can't help but judge people. I mean, we're normal. And so we see people and we start making up a story about them. And we will jump to conclusions based on what our own biases are, based, you know, uh, just as you said. And what I, what I try to remember and then what I share with, with other people, especially interviewers, is maybe that person didn't have a mentor to tell them how they needed to dress for an interview. Or maybe the person got hired, and now, especially for women, now they're wearing something to work that you think, oh my gosh, I can't believe she's wearing that. And what our tendency is, is to go talk to our buddy about that person, instead of giving that person some feedback in a kind, gentle way where they will hear it. After you give the feedback and you help and you try to help that person now, if they continue to dress in a way that is not gonna help their career, you know, then that might be on them. But our first impression uh, may oftentimes not be the right one. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug a colleague of mine. Her name is Jessica Pettit. And she wrote a book called Good Enough Now. And when she speaks, and she primarily is a um, keynote a, a professional speaker around LGBTQ plus issues. And what she says to her audiences is this, you're gonna make up a story anyway. Don't beat yourself up about the story that you make up. But triple space and use wide margins. Isn't that terrific? So you can fill in some of the facts. And I always wanna give her credit, I didn't create that. All right, looks like we got some other hands. Oh, right here. I think it's on. It should be on. I want to continue. You said if they continue to dress in a way that may not be beneficial to their career, then that's on them. So I will add a Challenge. question to that, right? Yeah. So I have students often that are going and interviewing, and the very specific example I will give is people of color and their hair. Yeah. So there are certain hairstyles that are deemed as unprofessional, and that is something that certain people may disagree that is unprofessional. However, if you understand that the prevailing sentiment of the institution in which this individual is interviewing is that that hairstyle is unprofessional, how do you counsel the student mm -hmm. that is deciding whether something that they see as part of their being or their, yes. you know, their culture, yes. which doesn't look unprofessional to them or anyone else in their circle, is seen as unprofessional in this setting, yes. how do you reconcile Thank that? you for asking that question and for catching me, because as soon as I was saying it's, that's on them, it's like, that's not exactly what I meant. Um, so two things, one of which will be a story, <laughs> but um, the immediate answer uh, is, and, and someone earlier asked me if I, if I speak to kids, and I'm, I'm not a youth speaker, but I do like to speak to older teenagers and, and young adults. And what I say to them is this, if you are not the person in charge of the rules, you need to know what the rules are. Now, that doesn't mean you have to follow all the rules, but if you're gonna break a rule, break it intentionally and have some understanding what the consequences are. So, uh, an example. Um, first, a personal example. I wear several bangle bracelets and I never take them off, much to the chagrin of airport security. 
<laughs> so I've been patted down in all the ways that they would pat you down. You know, thank goodness for the real big machines now, and all I have to do is put my hands up. Well, now I have pins in my feet, so I, you know I'll be able to say, yeah, I always need this big machine. But in any case, I've worn them. I started wearing them when I was 16. My grandparents raised me. Um, in the early years of my life. And so my grandmother started going on cruises and she asked me what I wanted as a gift. And I was from North Jersey, from Newark, New Jersey. So my, my girlfriends, many of whom were from Caribbean islands or their parents were, they all had Bengal bracelets and I didn't. So I asked my grandmother to bring me some Bengal bracelets. Well, she went on several cruises and of course they stop at several islands. Every time she went to a new island, she'd buy me another pair. She's no longer with me physically this is how I stay connected to her spirit, by not taking them off. So now fast forward, I'm an adult, I'm working at General Motors. I had been there about six months, and my job was to fly all over North America and run these, um, these management workshops along with a partner. This was in the 70s, so you know it had to be a white male partner. They were certainly not gonna send out two females way back then. And um, apparently I was doing pretty well, so my boss, Jerry, called me in his office one day and after about six months and he said, you know, your reviews are terrific, you're doing such a great job. And he said, you know, you've got potential with this company. He said, but there's one thing. Now Jerry's the kind of supervisor that didn't get to know the people he supervised very well, very much. He'd never asked me about my bracelets. And so he said, there's just this one thing now, when I was working at Michigan back in the 70s, now, by the way, I'm not old, I'm just seasoned. <laughs> when I was working at Michigan, I had a massive afro. And I quickly figured out before I accepted the job at Michigan that there was nobody walking around with hair like mine. So I straightened it. For me, it was just a hairstyle. It was not a statement, it was just a hairstyle. So when he's leading up to this thing that I knew was gonna be negative, I thought, well, I already straightened my hair, what could it be? And he said, you know, we're a conservative company. Now, I know you don't think of automotive companies as conservative, but they are. And he said, we're a conservative company, and, and if you wanna go further in this organization, you, pr you probably just, probably shouldn't wear all those bracelets. Now, my grandmother was still alive back then, but she was definitely channeling me because what I said, as it was coming out of my mouth, I thought I am making a career decision right now. <laughs> <laughs> because what I said to him was, Jerry, if I am held back from promotions because of these bangles, I'm probably not working in the right place. I was stunned as, as it came out of my mouth. He was definitely stunned that I had the nerve to say that. And what ultimately happened though, because he started telling other people that I answered his question, I, I responded that way, is I got more respect from people because of that answer. So know the rules so that when you break them, you're breaking them intentionally. Now specifically about hair, I was working with a um, uh, top level hotel chain, I'll put it that way. And um, I was working at all of their locations in the US and the Caribbean. So they had a new property opening in, uh, on St. Thomas. And for hotels, it is critical that they open on the day they said they're gonna open and they make a big deal of it, and it's a lot of uh, media coverage and all that kind of thing. And so I went down two weeks before they were supposed to open, and the general manager was in a panic. And she said, we haven't hired all of the, the staff that we need. And I said, why is that? She said, because we have this rule. She said, I found plenty of qualified people, but I couldn't hire them because we have this rule that their, the employee's hair has to be neat and clean. And I said, okay, keep talking. She said, well, you know, a lot of the really qualified people have locks. And so, oh, and the other rule was you couldn't wear braids. And this was policy written. And she said, I, I, we're not gonna be able to open. Well, when I came back to the States, I was called to talk to the executives at their headquarters. 
And um, I have come to know you just don't tell people things sometimes because they're not going to hear it. And so I just asked several questions. Help me know why you have this, this rule around hair. Well, because our clientele would be offended if people don't look neat and clean. And I said, well, help me understand why braids and dreads or dreadlocks might be offensive. Well, our clients would be uncomfortable. And I said, well, have you asked any of your clients? No. And I said, do your clients choose to go to St. Thomas and then choose to have their event at your facility? Or do they do it the other way around? And I said, well, we think they want to go to St. Thomas. And I said, well, do you think if they're out and about just walking off property that they would see people? <laughs> you see where I'm going with this, right? So it took me a while to get them to see, number one, their rule was only impacting a certain group of people and that that rule didn't make sense. It really reflected on their lack of knowledge. So they changed the rule somewhat. When I went back to the um, property on St. Thomas, I saw they did open on time. However, I didn't see any people with other than straight hair in any position that the guests would see. Then I went back six weeks, uh, six months later, because everybody in the whole property was going through this workshop that I had. So I went back six months later, and as I checked in, the front desk clerk had beautiful locks. So they eventually changed, and the policy got totally changed. So my point in sharing those two stories is some of it is about the individual, and some of it is about the structure, the organization that you talked about earlier. It has to go in both um, directions. But in today's environment where you know, there, there are people that might have um, tattoos and piercings in places that some other folks, older generally, are uncomfortable with, we need to recognize that that, me being a baby boomer, so that might be our va values as a baby boomer, but does that have anything to do with the job that they're required to deliver? So you have to be willing to ask those questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I see we have a couple of, Good. a few hands in the back. So, so I just want to speak um, or ask you to speak on, um, you say as leaders were looked at as um, having all the answers, but we don't. And we talk about giving this feedback to our employees. But I'm wondering if you can speak to receiving that feedback mm. and as leaders being able to receive the same feedback that we're giving. Yes, so what you're saying is if someone uses the stop technique on you, with you. <laughs> <laughs> stop technique and all of it. Or I mean, all of it, We're right. really right. quick to mm -hmm. be able to mm -hmm. give feedback to yeah. others. Um, so first of all, we have to, and I say we, I'm in this too, so we have to get over ourselves because we really don't know everything. And our teams will know more the more our teams know about each other and they share. Now, again, they don't have to bear their souls, but the more we know about individuals, the less likely we're going to have stereotypes or biases about people in that group because now we know individuals. So as leaders, when people are bringing feedback to you, feedback is a gift. Patient complaints are a gift because you won't know how to make things better if they don't bring that to you. Uh, now, sometimes they may not bring it to you the way you want to hear it, but give the person the benefit of the, the doubt. Most people are well-intentioned, and based on however their biases got formulated in their head from all the ways we've been bombarded, it may not come out exactly right, but be willing to at least hear it and say thank you for that feedback. And then you have to process it, depending on what it is. Thanks so much. We had, I thought there was another, yes, I was like, I thought there was another ramp back there. Where? There oh, we go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Uh, could you talk on the um, mantle or the identity of being an ally as well and the importance yes. of that in this, just on an individual, but also on driving that change mm -hmm. within our, our culture? Mm -hmm. A um, couple of things, because my collar is so big, um, normally when I speak, I, have a, I wear a little safety pin, but I, it was going to be way too much distraction <laughs> with that and the, and the collar. Um, and so one of the ways that I non-verbally show that I'm an ally is to wear a safety pin. And for those of you who might not um, 
know the story behind it. It's, it started many, many years ago, but present day, if a person wears a safety pin, one, it doesn't have to be fancy, but just a kind of a big safety pin so people can see it. A, it started out uh, over a few years ago of being a way to say you're an ally to the LGBTQ plus community. Now it's become a way of saying anyone who feels disenfranchised or excluded or needs someone to talk to and they don't know who that person might be if they're the only one of whatever it is, uh, wearing a safety pin is a way to uh, communicate that. So organizationally, you could do that to give signals to each other. Um, the other piece, though, of being an ally is to learn not to just say I'm inclusive and I want to hear stories and I want to be supportive, but you really need to put yourself in the circumstance of being the one that is the other. So I saw that you have several um, resource groups and I encourage you to go to resource groups meetings where you are not a part of that group. So guys should go to women's resource groups. Now don't overtake it, you know, um, but um, be the one who is different. What I'm finding uh, just over the last couple of years, many of the uh, organizations uh, where I have spoken, when it's a conference that's celebrating um, diversity and inclusion, they intentionally will invite, for women's groups in particular, they will intentionally invite men to come to that conference. With one organization, um, it was Boeing. This is good news, so I'll, I'll share. It was Boeing. Um, they have a women's conference every year, and last year when I spoke with them, they had a goal of having 10% of the member of the participants uh, to be male. They ended up having 15%. Now, they don't want to have a lot more than that, but the men constantly were saying through the workshops and, and the um, plenary sessions, it's, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Those men are now becoming allies because we just, we tend to think that the group that is oppressed in whatever way it is, they're the ones that's supposed to solve the problem. Not so. It's all of us. So when in our country we say, well, you know, this racism thing, well, black folks need to get it together. It's not a black problem. It's everybody's issue. And we need to stop just going to the people who are in the group, asking them, well, how do we solve it? It has to be all of us with all of those different perspectives. So be willing to be uncomfortable. I think over here. You, you had mentioned earlier in your presentation the, the brown bag, I think, experiment, oh, yes. and said you would get back to that. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could. Yes, thank yeah. you so much, for because I know a lot of people don't know that story because so much time has passed. Um, so during the Jim Crow era in our country, where supposedly people were now equal, um, if a black person applied for a job and they were qualified for that job, the last step in the process would be for the interviewer to take out a supermarket bag, a grocery bag, because back then they were all paper. So they would take out a, a, a grocery bag and hold it next to their skin. If that um, African-American person was darker than the bag, they didn't get hired. And it was totally okay. And it was pervasive constantly. So when, as you know, with unconscious bias, our messages come to us in all kinds of ways and we don't even know it's going into our head. So you fast forward to 2019, that particular bias is nowhere near as strong as it was years ago, but it does still exist. And it very much exists around the, the rest of the country. But literally it's called the brown bag test. Thank you for asking the question. Thanks, Steve. Oh, that was, that, was, that was her question. <laughs> All right, we got one over here. We can probably take about two or three more questions. Hi, so we have a brand new DEI team in our department. We're starting from scratch. We've got a group that seems ready to go and raring to do things. So I was just wondering if you had any kind of getting off the ground and getting running starting tips that Clarissa and her wonderful team have not already provided for us. So part of it you may be already doing, I'm very, very impressed with all of the um, trainings and all the other things that, uh, that you're doing here at the School of Medicine. Um, the learning never stops though, and so I would encourage your team to be uh, accountability partners to each other, to help each other continue to learn, um, because now your work group are they are going to think you have the answers and you're still learning. So one is to do some things to really help your team 
your group truly become a team? Because when you put people together, they're a group. They're not a team until they really begin to know each other and understand each other at a deeper level uh, and respect different um, perspectives so you can get to that diversity of thought. And as you pointed out earlier and it was uh, mentioned this morning as well around time, there is never enough time. So you have to make the time and make the time to get quiet and to hear. And when people come to you and you don't know the answer, be willing to say, I don't know the answer to that one, but I'm going to do my best to find out and get back to you. Because you'll get a lot of that, especially when you're first starting. All right. Any other questions? I have one more. If you oh, want yeah, one more. <laughs> All right. I, I paused hopefully long enough. I don't want to. Um, so what about the opposite end of the spectrum? I think you've addressed that like we're a good group of this is the the people who are, we're all thinking about this, but how do you start the conversation with um, the late to the party team? <laughs> Give me an example of what might come up. Uh, why do I need to send someone? We're already, you know, it seems like we're doing fine. Mm. So get good at asking questions, because they're essentially saying, I don't need this, right? And so if they think they're doing fine, then respond in whatever, in your own words, but essentially respond with, help me understand why you think that. Tell me some examples of where we're doing well. Might there be some places we could do better? So look for ways to ask questions rather than trying to convince them based on what you know. And that might be one of the ways your team can work together on, okay, so when people say these kind of things, what are some responses we can have for them? That's a really good one. I think being able to ask really solid questions is always really, really, really important and helps us move along. Um, what, we have one last thing. Is there any other questions before I move on? And one of the, the questions that we often hear a lot about in our organization is around how do we hire people that better reflect the communities in mm -hmm. southeastern Michigan? Um, and how do we do that in a way that doesn't make people feel like they're just being tokenized mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or just being, in, you know, asked to be a part of the process yes. uh, because of who they are as a part of a community? And so I was curious if you had any thoughts or ideas about that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just know that there are always going to be some people that believe you got your job because you're a woman, you're African American, you're a whatever it, whatever the difference is. There's always going to be some folks who believe that. However, one of the things that you can do in the, um, the uh, recruiting process, and it was touched on this morning, is you really must broad, if you want different people, you need to look in different places. And so broaden the spectrum of places where you go. And I, I have this, I won't call it a debate, but a heated discussion with so many of my clients because they're saying, well, we need the best engineers or we need the best whatever it is. And so we only go to Stanford, we only go to Harvard, we only, and I said, do you think there are smart people other places? You know, so I go back to asking questions again. Uh, and of course they'll say yes. And I said, well, if you're not finding the amount of diversity that you want by only going to these five places, then perhaps you need to broaden it. And there are some schools that may not be in your mind top tier schools that have excellent programs. So find out about those programs and get involved and get visibility uh, and interview, interview um, students from those schools. So that's one thing. However, the other thing is if you want diversity in whatever that way that is, know that in the interviewing process, there's always bias. So you need to do a few things. Number one, when you know you're going to interview someone, talk to your colleagues about some of the biases that come up so that it's um, front and center in your brain so you'll be less likely to rely on it. The other is if you're going to um, narrow your candidates down to 10 people, so I'll just use 10 uh, as a model, and somehow this just keeps working. Every time I work with my clients, it works. So if you're going to have 10 candidates that you interview, then you cannot have just one person who is different. 
whether it's one woman, one person of color, one gay person, one whatever it is. Because what happens is all of the interviewers only see the difference. That's not their intention, but their eyeballs go to the difference, even if it's not a visible difference. Two is not good enough either, because what happens, now this is if you have 10, if you have two candidates who are different, and they can be diverse in different ways, but if you only have two candidates that are different, then the interviewers compare them to each other. They're still not comparing them to the competencies you're looking for, the skills, abilities, and talent. So if you have a group of 10, you have to have at least three people that are different. For some reason, if you have at least three people that are diverse, then the interviewers will tend to look at everybody more equally. Um, but again, at, lastly, I would say, um, what my experience has been is very often people will say, we want more diversity, but they don't value it the same way they're valuing the other competencies. So if you say you want diversity, then don't, don't make it a nice to have. As you interview the candidates and you've interviewed some of your buddies, if you want diversity of thought, that needs to carry weight just like some of the other skills and abilities. So when you're evaluating all 10 candidates, diversity becomes one of the, the diversity they would bring becomes one of the factors that you weigh in. Absolutely. We're, I think we got a mic coming. coming. The mic is coming to you. <laughs> got two of them coming to you. <laughs> Turn it on. Turn it on so they can hear you. The mic is not for you. It's for everybody else. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, everybody can hear me. So the, the question I had for you, which I don't know if there's a simple answer or not to it, is you mentioned diversity of thought, which is, you know, a really important part of diversity. How, there's, there's things we can sort of judge, at least we think we can, around diversity that are visible, easy. But if you're... If you're really interested in the diversity of thought, how do, we, how do we evaluate for that? How do we make sure when we are selecting these candidates that they have that mm. type of diversity? Is there a way that we can do that um, prior to kind of the interview process? Prior to the interviewing process? Well, well because if, if, we don't, if we don't somehow know we're bringing in a group right. with diverse thought, mm -hmm. um, you know, we might end up with a whole bunch of people that sort of still think that. Right the same way. So the homework to be done before you're bringing in the candidates is to really look at where are the candidates coming from? What are the experiences that they may have had? It, whether they're, you're recruiting from um, universities or you know, it's people with experience already. So when you look at um, what their, their um, experiences might be, then, and again, I encourage people to talk to each other about what those experiences might mean. So for example, and I'll use a, a university um, example, um, people assume that folks that come to, that go to University of Michigan, of course, are very smart. <laughs> now, that would be a good bias, right? <laughs> At least we would all think that in this room. So, you know, people that have graduated from University of Michigan, okay, I, that's gonna be a great candidate because they went to this school. When really they made a good decision to come to this school, we don't necessarily know that they can do what it is we might want to hire them for. Let's assume that they're being interviewed someplace else, you know, not not here. Um, but there might be folks that have gone to, you know, that other school down the road a bit <laughs> that uh, made a good decision to go there, and maybe that student happens to be somebody who it took them five years to finish undergrad because they worked their way through school. We might be making an assumption, I'm just using U of M as an example, but you know, it could be Harvard or Stanford, we make an example, oh, they got, out, they got through in four years, they must be smart. No, they must probably had some help. They didn't have to worry about working to pay their bills and that kind of thing. Here's my point is, we tend to look at some things as negative when maybe that person that went to the other school and it took them five years has a better work ethic that is more persistent, more um, determined to do, do really well. We don't want to exclude them before we even see them. And that's a tough one 
because those folks like faculty that you said already that don't, they're the slowest to change. It's a tough one because they'll be really set. No, we only need to go to these places. And if you want diversity, you can't just keep going to the same places. So you do the research ahead of time on the, on the sources where your candidates are gonna come from and then talk about what they might bring um, that other candidates may or may not bring. I hope that answers it somewhat. Any other questions? I think we have time for maybe a couple more. And then I want to close with one comment. Awesome. Beth. One thing we also want when we're interviewing are people who are going to embrace what we're trying to do. Yes. And, you know, a cultural shift takes everybody. So any hints on interviewing for people who may not be in a marginalized group, but you want, you want them to be on board. Mm -hmm. And um, also just understanding we all have our biases, even if you're in a marginalized group. And you know, that, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'd be very articulate, but yes, I Yes, I understand. understand. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and certainly we should not assume that because a person looks like they're in a marginalized group that they're gonna be more open-minded to people of difference. That's a big mistake. Because um, bias and prejudice and all of that kind of stuff comes in every kind of package. Um, that's where you wanna work with each other to develop questions that are not easy questions to answer. So you would be asking open-ended questions. Help me, tell, share with me some experiences where you've worked with people that are very different than you, or maybe you were on a study team that was very different than you. Tell me how you handled when you had to interact with somebody who totally disagreed with you. You know, those kinds of questions to get a sense, because you might find that the person who you think is least diverse in their thinking is the one that's most diverse. Depends on the questions. <laughs> the fight of the They're microphone. <laughs> so this question kind of comes from a discussion we had at our table. Um, and it kind of started out with one of the people at our table is from Canada. And he talked about how Canada has like a multicultural, I don't know, leader, a person in that position. You're talking minister, about the prime minister? Um, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how here in America, in the US, we talk about it being a melting pot, which is kind of like everybody comes and they get melted together and they're all supposed to be the same. Right. I mean, that's kind of what that analogy that's would right. make you think. And then it made us think, so with diversity, you wanna allow space for people to like be, themselves and yet in an organization you also have to have some structure and sameness to get things done and so we were kind of like so how do you make that balance how yes. <laughs> yeah so i totally disagree i know that we disagree with the 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 analogy that we're a melting pot um, i think that is in many regards the people that came here through Ellis Island, the folks that were checking them in and changing their names and all that kind of thing, there was this sense of melting pot. However, I like to think of us as a, a really good tossed salad. <laughs> so really good tossed salad means that the black olive doesn't have to give up being a black olive and the kale doesn't have to give up being kale. But when you put all of that together, it's nutritious and it tastes good. So nobody had to give anything up, but they did have to respect whoever else they're in a bowl with and you know, value and understand them. So I see it much more as a, um, as a um, tossed salad. And um, around the piece of, of how do you value the authenticity when you need to have some structure, again, it goes back to being clear about what your structure is doing. The one area where I would get pushback, uh, usually in a workshop, because I don't touch on it that directly in the keynotes most of the time, but if I'm doing a workshop and, um, and we're talking about all different kinds of ways we're uniquely different, usually someone at, at a break 
will come up to me and they'll say, okay, Lenore, I, I understand all this stuff and I respect everybody, and, um, but I, I just don't understand that LGBTQ thing. You know, and usually they don't say the letters right and I'm kind of have a sense of where their biases are coming from. And so I said, well, help me understand what you're saying. And they'll say, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I just, I don't need to know all of that stuff. And you know, many of the stereotypical things people will say. And um, so it goes back to getting really good at asking questions. So most often my question is, so tell me what makes you uncomfortable? And usually they will say, well, I'm, I'm good as long as they stay over there. I said, well, so what is it you fear? And so, well, I don't want them hitting on me. And my answer is, if you're straight, what makes you think a gay person is going to waste their time hitting on you? <laughs> and, you know, I say with a smile and all of that. And, and if I'm using that example in front of a group, the same thing happens. People will laugh and that kind of breaks the tension a little bit. And I'll say, okay, so... So let's back up now. So what you're saying is you don't want anybody at work hitting on you. Right. I don't want that to happen. And I said, well, okay, so do you, ha you have a policy, right, that people aren't supposed to ha give, you know, unwanted advances? Yes. And I said, do straight people ever break that rule? Yes. You're trying to get a lot of yeses. This is a sales technique. <laughs> yes. And I said, okay, so the the problem, the issue is not having to do with the person's sexual uh, orientation or their gender identity. It has to do with breaking the rules. And both gay people and straight people might break the rules, and it's the rule that needs to be followed. It doesn't have anything to do with being gay. Now, that is an example I would use because it's in the workplace, you, because the other thing that people will say is, you know, my religion tells me that, and they go into a whole religious thing. So I'm not questioning your beliefs one way or the other, but in the workplace, we need some structure. We need to have some um, a code of conduct on how people interact with each other. And when people aren't following that code of conduct, then that's what the issue is. It doesn't have anything to do uh, with their sexual orientation or their gender identity. So it's back to uh, this morning, oftentimes it came back to what is the structure that we have in place that inhibits people from being who they fully are or it, you know, or, or it only advances certain people. Thank you so much for all of your amazing questions. Um, we're going to go ahead, and I know, Lenora, you said you had a few comments that you wanted to leave us yes. with, and we've just enjoyed you so much, I want to say that. Thank you very much. Well, I just want to leave you with this quote. It's, it just happens to be my most favorite quote uh, as it relates to this work, and particularly as it relates to talking to leaders. And it's one of the quotes from Maya Angelou. Many of you may know it. I have learned that people will forget what I said. They will forget what I did but they will never forget how I made them feel. And I think as leaders and as diversity and inclusion uh, and equity allies, if we can remember that our goal is to help the people that we're interacting with to feel good when we are in their presence and when they leave, ultimately that's an inclusive environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And that is uh, kind of similar to the vision statement that OHE has, where we're creating a world where everyone uh, feels valued and can thrive. In fact, when we um, worked through that process, we initially said that we want everyone to be valued, but we felt it was really important that they feel valued because that is their personal uh, perception. So we'll have one more round of the uh, awards for um, promoting um, uh, the Net Promoter Score and uh, doing very well. And this is for our group of individuals with 500 or more people. And uh, this award will go, we have uh, Patty Andreski and um, Phyllis Blackman again. This uh, award will go to the Department of Anesthesiology. 
uh, and so they're huge. They're one of the largest departments in at Michigan Medicine, and the DEI leads for them are Matthew Wixon and Brittany Holmes, and their net promoter score is 15.4. So someone from anesthesia here that can come up and receive their award. We will bring it to them. I think I'm in the OR in a day or two. I'll drop it off. Uh, so we'll continue to, uh, to give out these awards in the future. It's really important that we are always uh, understanding where we are and what direction we're moving. Uh, and so we'll continue with the net promoter score. A lot of this work that we're doing, as has been stated throughout the day, is not done alone. It's done with all of you. And it's also done with a lot of our facilitators and the relationships that we have with them. Right now, I want to introduce uh, another member of the OHE team. It's Michael Harrington, who's our training specialist lead. And he's going to talk to you a little bit more about our facilitators. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Yes? No? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, why don't we take a minute, if you feel like stretching, just take a minute and, uh, you know, whatever works for you. Why don't, why don't we do like a 60-second stretch? And then what I'd like to do is the folks, um, do we have the list, the next slide? The list of the folks, the facilitators? If you're on, if you are present and you are one of these names, could you come forward while folks are stretching? That would be great. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you for coming up. So I know, I know not everybody uh, could be here this afternoon. Actually, some folks are facilitating this afternoon. That's why they're not here. Um, but it is my privilege to recognize and thank this group of folks. What they do, thank you. What they do in terms of facilitation, they do this on top of what they already have a full plate in terms of their full-time positions. They don't do this for extra compensation. Um, and I'm, in a minute, I'm going to ask them why they do it, because I want you to hear their responses as to why they do it. Say I primed you so you could think for a minute while I talk about why you do this work. Um, but this is really instrumental in terms of our mission, in terms of helping everybody uh, feel like they belong, that they can thrive. The whole idea of giving people the opportunity uh, for learning, for the opportunity to think about um, their own identities and how it affects their behavior, the opportunity for awareness, uh, the opportunity potentially for change. And what a privilege it is to be in that space, to go up in front of a group of people and facilitate that kind of learning and how exciting that is. Um, it's such an important part in terms of what we do in terms of, and also in terms of helping build bridges you know, in terms of relationships. So I could talk on and on about why we do this work, but I wanted to ask them why they chose to, to become a facilitator. Whatever you want. Hello, my name is Reginald Beasley, and the reason why I do this is because I want to inspire the next people that come in to take the pastor baton to them to inspire people to think different and outside of the box. Good afternoon, Tina Jordan. And I do this work because I absolutely love people and I love learning. And to have those two things happen simultaneously while people are developing relationships with each other is just amazing to me. And I, I'm all, um, also a proponent of constant improvement, and we can all grow all the time. Um, 
My name is Christina Klein. Uh, I'm the ADA coordinator at the university, and so my training and facilitation focuses primarily on disability. And the reason why I do this is because I was honored to be asked to be part of the discussion around disability, really starting to highlight the fact that diversity not only includes disability, but that there's so much diversity within disability itself, and to really get people to start thinking about and raise their awareness about what we can do to create an environment that is inclusive and welcoming um, to everybody. And more importantly, on top of what Tina said, I've loved doing this because it's actually made me better um, because I'm able to share my own missteps here and there, my own opportunities to learn, and really welcomed people to give me feedback and actually start conversations with me that has helped me broaden my own perspectives as well. So it's helped personal improvement. Hello again. Um, my name is Steve Vinson. I work in ambulatory care finance. Uh, I've been doing finance for about 15 years. So first of all, doing this work allows me to get out of the office and not do finance, which is <laughs> awesome. Um, but also, uh, I think we've all felt marginalized in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and so I think doing this work uh, helps um, people feel like it's okay to uh, be themselves, be authentic, uh, and bring out the humanity, as Lenora said earlier, bring out the humanity and, and recognize the humanity uh, and, and bond with that humanity of everybody that we, we work with in this space. So. Hi, my name is Latanya Berryhill, and I'm the office manager at the Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health Research. And to be honest, I have a total fear of public speaking. It is my biggest fear, and when someone first approached me and asked me to do unconscious bias training, I laughed and said, you've got to be kidding me. And they asked me about three different times, and I continued to say no. And finally, she said, either you're going to get on the bus or you're not. And so it was a little guilt. But at the end of the day, I did it because I'm passionate about this work, and I wanted to learn, and I wanted to help others, and I wanted to get over my fear. I'm not really sure what to say. My name is Candace Myers. I work with Gifts of Art here at the health system. And when I was approached with this idea, I realized I had some experiences that had proven to me my ignorance. And I thought, well, if I'm coming from a position of privilege, I owe it to everyone to educate myself. And I can be effective then because there's a certain population that will look at me and listen to me that may not listen to everyone else. So I'm owning that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. And they were not prepped for this, by the way. So this was a spontaneous thing. And there's some folks that aren't here. Um, Tanisha McLaughlin, Grayson, um, Catherine Galora, uh, also Denise Williams, Charmaine Ward, Jana Palmer, Pedro, who you met this morning, uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. And so, and, and of course, Clarissa Love, who just does uh, an incredible amount of wonderful work and facilitation, very much. And our partners at Org Learning that are here and how, how that a partnership is so important to us. And so thank you to our partners from Org Learning and our partners from Org Effectiveness. Uh, really appreciate you. And while I'm thanking everybody, I also wanna thank our training coordinator, Catherine Pearsall. Without her, she is the backbone in terms of, of, of all the organization of fielding all your requests and getting the scheduling and doing some consultations with you. So I wanna thank Catherine. Uh, and we have certificates for folks. So before you leave, make sure we want you, we have a little token of our appreciation. And the last piece is a public service announcement for doing facilitation. So. Uh, we've started a new program, a train the trainer model. We had a, a first cohort. We're doing training on how to first hold, hold DEI conversation, and then we'll kind of take it from there. So we had our first cohort, it was successful. We're gonna be offering three more. Um, we have a next cohort starting. Uh, it's on October 14th, and that one's already full. We're doing a specialized session for a department. Um, there's also gonna be an opportunity to do facilitation on LGBTQ plus awareness. Uh, a session that we're looking to build our bandwidth with facilitation. So um, I hope I hope there's a few out there that what these folks have said have garnered some interest from you uh, moving forward. And again, a round of applause for these folks and the wonderful work that they do. And now we're gonna shift gears. 
So um, next, Peggy Wright is going to talk about the, the mini grant uh, award winners, but I just want to say a word about Peggy. Peggy is the person in our office with the total can-do attitude, and it's such a privilege to be around someone who's so positive and contributes in so many special ways. So I just wanted to say that about Peggy before she comes up, but here's Peggy. That's hard to follow. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be in, um, included here in announcing our sixth round of Michigan Medicine DEI mini grants. And first, I would like to introduce to you our leadership of our mini grant committee, um, Ms. Phyllis Blackman, who is the director of the Office for Health Equity Inclusion, and um, Ms. Alfreda Rooks, who I don't think could, is on her way. <laughs> and she's the director of our um, community health programs. So, um, yeah, okay, when Alfreda comes in, we'll just welcome her. <laughs> so I'd like to thank our reviewers this round. Every round we try to engage um, different reviewers and their names are up on the screen. We had uh, Dr. Yolaine Seville, Dr. Angela Elam, Dr. Daniel Whitney, Dr. Nana Sifa, Dr. Monica Colvin, Dr. Polly Gibson, Steve Vinson, Wayne Millette, Ann Murphy, LaTanya Berryhill, Dana Habers, Ann Smith, Reggie Beasley, Maureen Fasson, and Fitz Tavernier, and our own Yvette Harris. So I want to say uh, thank you very much to all of them for their time and talent. Okay. This round we had eight winners, and without further ado, on behalf of the Department of Pharmacy, here today accepting the award from the class of 2021 student, Melinda Lee. Are you here, Melinda? Hey. And Melinda brought her advisor, Annalise Sheehan. Thank you. This award was in the amount of $3,868 and will be used to increase accessibility of our anticoagulation education materials to patients with limited English proficiency. Translating these materials to Spanish, Arabic, and Mandarin is an innovative Michigan medicine practice and it will comply with the Joint Commission's national safety goal. Thank you, Melinda. Next, we have, on behalf of the medical student group, Winding Roads, um, applicant John Runge could not be here today, but a delegate, uh, Ricky Tang, are you here? Oh, okay. Ricky will be accepting the award on John's behalf today. Winding Roads is a medical student organization that supports learners in our community who self-identify as non-traditional students. Some examples would be career changers, military veterans, or parents. Acknowledging the value of these diverse experiences outside of medicine can add to our medical school la landscape. This mini grant will fund an inaugural half day retreat to promote wellness for these students and others within our Michigan medical school community. The funds for this pilot will launch an annual event of networking, host a speaker from an outside institution to broaden personal and professional networks for students. Congratulations. Our next award is on behalf of Interpreter Services. Applicant James Check is here to accept the award and the amount of $3,600 to create short informational videos for limited English proficiency patients and their caregivers at Michigan Medicine. <laughs> this series of short informative videos for LEP patients will foster respect and understanding between patients and caregivers by creating these two to three minute videos that will help orient LEP patients to the inpatient experience and inform providers of strategies, tools, and resources that will help them better care for their patients. All the videos will be in Spanish, Arabic, Mandarin, Japanese, and ASL. All will be captioned in English. Looking forward to that. Thank you. 
Um, next, I think uh, Alexander Reardon, on behalf of the Department of Pediatrics, could not attend today. I don't know if there's anyone here from pediatrics that would like to represent. But this award is for $5,000 for the research on gender disparity and the assessment of children's pain. Appropriate treatment of pediatric pain requires providers to make judgments about the magnitude of pain experienced by their patients. The presence of bias in these assessments can have important implications for patient care. This research will be shared broadly and nationally. So congratulations. Thank you, Alexander. Um, someone else, another medical student, Christian Black, could not be here today. But on behalf of the Department of Urology, this award of $5,000 for the applicant, Christian Black, is um, for Euroversity. This is an innovative and very detailed um, syllabus he detailed in his application. I can vouch for that. But um, it's an innovative pipeline program aimed to increase the number of underrepresented students from the University of Michigan Medical School applying to urology. The Euroversity project is an enrichment and mentorship program for students, house officers, attendings in the Department of Urology, and we congratulate Christian Black. I just want to say on a side note here, out of eight, or eight awardees today, oh, half of them are students. And I think that's a testimony to our um, medical school, their engagement, you know how busy medical students are that they took the time to even fill out the application. So um, their ideas are amazing. Um, next we have, On behalf of Fast Forward Medical Innovation, applicant Candace Stedjink. Is Candace here? Hi, Candace. Candace will be accepting the award in the amount of $1,450 for the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Workshop. This program will offer a three hour workshop that focuses on social entrepreneurship and its implications. Dr. Ted London will be the keynote speaker. He is a fellow for the William David Institute Scaling Impact Initiative here at Michigan. He will focus on designing enterprise strategies and poverty alleviation approaches for low-income markets, developing market entry capabilities, building cross-sector collaborations, and assessing poverty reduction outcomes of business ventures. Thank you, Candace. Um, another student application on behalf of Family Medicine, the University of Michigan Adaptive Sports Student Group has been awarded the amount of $5,000 to develop adaptive sports roller sled hockey at Michigan Medicine. I'm going to play that. The applicants are medical students and leaders of the Adaptive Sports Student Group. Maureen Fasson, Quentin Solano, and Brendan Ellsworth were the um, students who filled out the application and represent. Unfortunately, they're, or fortunately, they're on their rotations and working hard. Noting that half of all adults with disabilities do not get even 10 minutes of aerobic activity per week, the roller sled hockey program will benefit students, patients, and community members able-bodied and disabled by promoting healthy living and social inclusion for all. Uh -huh. And the last one is on behalf of the Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Accepting the award today is Kylie Adams. Kylie, still here? Kylie. And um, with Kylie was Becca Rowe, Kinsey Veer, and Juwan Park. Are they all here? No, okay. Alec Bernard and Allie Herman were um, also unable to be here today. Thank you, Kylie. The Department of Physical uh, Medicine and Rehabilitation has been awarded the amount of $3,175 for a trail wheelchair to provide medical students access to CAMP. Sorry. CAMP stands for Creating Adventurous and Mindful Physicians. It's a pre-orientation student-led wilderness program offered by M Home for in incoming medical students. While this trip is a great opportunity for medical students, it wasn't accessible for all those with disabilities. And now they'll be buying a trail wheelchair. So thank you all.
I want to thank you all for submitting applications, and we will have another round. If you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out for the criteria or the deadlines or the link to the Qualtrics. Um, it's been a great honor to be part of this. We've had over 50 mini grants now that we've um, awarded over the past three years, and I've just been proud to be part of it, and I'm proud to work at an institution that is so innovative and inclusive. Thank you. As Michael prepares to come up, I'm all the way in the back. If you just received a mini-grant, we're going to take a group photo. So if all of the mini-grant recipients uh, could c go over to the right, uh, they're going to take one group photo. Those of you who know me know that I'd rather, instead of talking or doing a, a teaching, I'd rather do activities. And so we're going to finish uh, with, a, with a brief activity. And this is really modeling the whole idea of building relationships. Really the cornerstone in terms of our own learning around diversity, equity, and inclusion isn't really the classes that we take. Uh, it's really how we endeavor to interact with other people and the opportunities there are uh, to build bridges. And so that's where we're going to spend the next uh, 15 minutes doing an activity doing just that. So without further ado, what I'd like you to do is find somebody in the room that you have not met yet or you don't know very well. So go ahead and take the time to do that. Find, pair up with somebody that uh, you don't know very well or um, haven't met yet. Has everybody found somebody? Is anybody alone? Okay. Are we ready? Okay. So what I'd like you to do, um, we've talked a lot about building relationships, relationships today and a lot of folks shared what has worked for them. So what I'd like you to do is each take a turn, about 90 seconds each, I'll, I'll, I'll time it with my phone. What has worked for you in terms of building relationships? What are one or two things that have really worked for you um, in terms of building relationships? So go ahead, begin.
energy to be coming. If you haven't switched yet, go ahead and uh, go ahead and switch. Uh, the question is: one thing that's really worked in terms of building relationships. One or two things. Okay, stop. Well, now that you've gotten to know your neighbor and it's time to bid a fond farewell. So what, I, what I'd like you to do is uh, after that fond farewell, find one other person that uh, maybe that you haven't met yet or you don't know very well. So go ahead and say goodbye and move on and find somebody else. Has everybody found someone? Not yet. Okay. 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 Well, here's the next question. We had fun coming up with this one. So you remember from school, the show and tell? So think about if you could bring one object from home that represents you, you know, one object from home that, that represents you, what would it be and describe that um, to the person you're with? Just like show and tell, if you could bring an object from home that represents you, what would it be and why? Okay, ready, go.
If you haven't switched yet, switched yet, go ahead and do that. Okay, stop. Has everyone had a chance to, we good? Okay. So this last question is a question uh, for you with yourself. So if you, you can either go back and sit if you're, if you're standing now if you'd like or stay where you are, it doesn't matter. But this last question is the commitment piece and this is for yourself. And that is, uh, today Lenora talked, to, Lenora, Lenora talked about, um, it doesn't cost us anything to affirm somebody. You know, someone, I think the example is when someone has an idea and then the idea that we affirm that idea, it doesn't cost us a thing. So what I'd like you to think about is and spend a minute um, before we do our closing and thinking think about someone that affirmed you in some critical juncture whether it's at work recently or maybe sometime earlier in your career but um, an affirmation that was very important for you at the time you know the timing was great and uh, you know really helped you to move forward and and move on uh, in a positive way so Think about who that person is and make a commitment that you're going to contact them if they're still with us. You know, make a commitment that you're going to contact them and say a thank you and tell them the story about how important that affirmation was. So that's what we'd like to finish with. So think about that for uh, a minute. And uh, with that, um, for our closing, speaking of relationship building, I'm very fortunate to work with Phyllis Blackman and it's my privilege to bring up Phyllis to do our closing. Thanks, everybody. Wow, what a day. It's been a great day, and I thank each and every one of you for participating today, and thanks to all of you who were able to stay the entire day. I know that is a commitment, but I thank you for your commitment in being here all day to affirm our diversity efforts that we have. So as I said, we are grateful for your participation, not only today, but every day as you champion for more a more inclusive environment as we as, as we go forward please remember the criticality of respect civility in your daily interactions use your dei and high reliability efforts as a working example to inspire those who have yet to participate in the numerous activities across campus 
Remember that the OHE website is a great point of reference when looking for events and learning opportunities. Share this information and encourage your audiences to attend. These events and workshops are opportunities for us to continue to work together. When we collaborate, we reinforce better working relationships to strengthen the DEI principles that we have worked so diligently to implement. We want your voices at the forefront of the conversation surrounding inclusiveness at Michigan Medicine. Continue to bring your voice to our community conversation and open forums held every Friday, every first Friday, and every third Thursday. I encourage you to participate in your, your commitments and, to, and concerns that reflect accurately in the feedback of our leadership. We want to make sure that your voices are heard and we can carry it forward to our leadership. In closing, I'd like to thank our keynote speaker, Lenore Billings-Harris, for your wonderful presentation. We learned so much. Thank you for the resources that you provided for us. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to also thank Drs. Brungi and Brown and Tony Denton for your leadership and continued to support of all of our DEI efforts. Thank you to our panel for sharing your perspectives on leading across difference. To our presenters, thank you for showing how we're building bridges for sustainable change. To our many grant reviewers, thank you. To our many grant recipients, we look forward to hearing the journey of your accomplishments so that we can come back next year and share. To our trainers and facilitators, thank you. This work cannot be done without you. I encourage you all to be part or even step out of your comfort zone and to be a trainer or facilitator or how you can be engaged in some of the work that happens in our office. And thank you for this commitment that you've made the strong commitment for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'd also like to thank Clarissa Love and Sue Shrek and all of the talented people we have in our OHE office. So I'm gonna ask the OHE team to please stand and be recognized. Remember these faces, they can all help you in one way or another or direct you to the resources. So thank you, Team Ohe, makes me very proud. So we have built something very special and innovative, and most importantly, sustainable. We measure, we change, we measure again, and we actually have the opportunity to share with you the changes that we made. So the sustainability is important. This is not just the end of our diversity work five-year plan and we're done. No, we are on a mission to change the culture at Michigan Medicine and you help us to do that. So, thank you. We want to make sure that you remember that we want to make Michigan Medicine a place where everyone feels valued and can thrive. I welcome you to join us next year, April 13th, 2020, for our next DEI Summit. Please put that on your calendars. Please share that with your leaders. We want to be proactive in making sure that people have enough time to plan. We will send a location out to you, but we have secured a date. So that's April 13th, 2020. That is a Monday. So again, I thank you for your participation. Thank you for your engagement. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you.